we are at war. People talk about World War III. We've been at war for a long time. So the collective is a very dangerous thing. It is our responsibility over planetary affairs. We need to move like the Chinese, bro. We were a time and space rule. Ancient psychology and adoration of God, they would consume their God. Right? They're not trying to give you the basis of what makes you who you are. I mean, there's no excuse for us to still have the quote-unquote proverbial street. We get indoctrinated with everyone else's ancestors but our own. You don't create nothing new if it ain't broken. Mm. We don't actually want to work for God. We want God to work for us. I appreciate my pops for teaching me how to be a God. From a boy to a man and ultimately back to the natural state of being and to a God. Be as God, we're supposed to always move with that higher self. And I have to be able to execute it. Having knowledge is not power, the execution of knowledge is power. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Because the only real knowledge you can get is knowledge of self. Peace family is 19 Keys with another high level conversation. Today, we're brought to have a very powerful uh, conversing with someone who I've been actually wanting to have on this show since the beginning of it. You know, throughout the world, throughout ages, I believe that there are certain masters of the mystics, if you will. People who can see and people who can do things and people who know things that the average mind not only doesn't want to know, either has the inability to or doesn't want to know. Because sight comes with responsibility, right? Ability comes with accountability to do something with what you know and what you have. And sometimes that's the sharing of that gift that you have. And the sharing is the work within itself because each one of us has our own duty of what we're supposed to do with what we're supplied with, right? You know, my goal with this platform is to give even more platform for those who should be known and not known from an egoistic, praiseworthy standpoint, but from a value standpoint, because we are at war. People talk about World War III. We've been at war for a long time, and there's been way more wars than three. <laughs> this this war is a war that will never end right even when the war is won a new war begins and that's the maintaining of that victory the maintaining of that state right the ideas of freedom justice equality equanimity equity whatever you want to go to all require war in order to maintain right to see the unseen is to teach the world beyond their senses Senses make man ignorant because he relies on them to learn things that his senses cannot teach him. And a man can be manipulated through his senses. When we speak word, we are not speaking from root. The root comes from the number and the number comes from the frequency. And so our intuition, our senses, our intuitive understanding of things is the true language of reality before we condense it down to other forms, right? Now, the good brother A.A. Rashid is somebody that has been an introducer of knowledge to many who once knew nothing about Kabbalah, mysticism, um, the dark arts, if you will, design, justice position, he is a lecturer, he is a teacher, he is an educator, he is a scholar in his own masterful right. He is a person that has led the leaders, influenced the influencers. You know, he helps those 
with the protocols of design to understand the symbols of reality, to use them because symbols are a language within themselves. And one thing that I've always admired about the brother is his ability to give instant praise. I see the brother and he say legend, right? And when he does that, it's almost like he's evoking a destiny for you to fulfill. Whether you feel you are a legend or not, he's giving you a mission and he's evoking purpose around you. And if you don't have somebody that can give you that feeling and evoke that purpose, then perhaps you need to increase the circles in your circle, mm. right? You need to increase the sacred geometry around you so that people can activate that with within that you may not even be able to see, but certain words unlock. Mm. So without further ado, I'm about to have a very powerful conversation with one of the keys right, of the world, of our society, the good brother, one one Rashid, uh, otherwise known as A. A. Rashid. How you feeling today? Peace and love. Peace, Peace and love. love. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Man, thank you for being here. Yes, sir. So I want to open up talking about, you know, magi, magic, imagination, right? This word is intertwined, specifically magi is intertwined into creation so heavily, right? image when we see something right when we say i imagine it starts with either the ego or the i right and then we talk about imagination right then we talk about magic itself then we talk about magicians right how is it that you know this word or why is it i guess is the better why is it that certain words or this particular word of the i m a g i or the magi you know is so powerful in its language context that it holds so much meaning. And I ask that because I believe we are deep into the age of the Magi, deep into the age of imagination, where nothing stays in the mind anymore, right? It is heavily condensed and then brought out into instantly a new dimension. Thought that you used to have to go through you know, pressure in order to get brought out can be brought out in a couple clicks of some buttons, right? So where are we at with this idea of, number one, if we can start off, what is magic and what is magi to you? Thank you for your question. Question is a wonderful one. I just want to preface before we answer it. Yes, sir. That the word magic is not an ancient word. Mm. And that the word magic is a word uh, which was recently added post-religion to, in a sense, uh, explain away the ignorance of um, our original religions encompassed us participating in behaviors that would be reminiscent of magic, that would be reminiscent of sorcery. Religion, in particular for the African American, disassociated us from that um, that ability to coalesce our minds with the unfolding creative processes of the universe. So, what we term magic are those. It, it has a a negative connotation now, mm. and it's associated with the term image because images are associated with magic because they were both maligned and we were uh, instructed not to and even persecuted and killed and executed if we were found doing anything reminiscent of any of our ancient spiritual practices. So we see all throughout the uh, the uh, religious narratives, there's always this, uh, this command that thou shalt not create graven images. Mm. And if you, if you look at <clears throat> our culture, our ancient culture, our ancient culture was all about making images, mm. imagination. We have in our culture a utility of mind where we did not have this free-for-all thinking. We always had some place to put our thoughts. 
and we knew how to explain away ignorance and to embrace the reality of the infinite by placing um, very propitious parameters, associating them with terms and words that some were open for the uh, layman or those, uh, and if you're in a true civilization or a true culture, you you know that you oftentimes get initiated into your culture because your mm-hmm. culture has um has a reward system in, inclusive in it, and it's there to um enable the participant on how to survive, mm-hmm. right? So many of our cultures they instructed us in. And um, I want I want to digress and like advance directly to what we you know I, I'm I'm gathering what we're speaking of, and I'm very interested and intrigued at how many instances in modern religion the participant is told not to do everything that we used to do in Africa mm. to establish what it is that we call our culture. Mm. So including and this is another interesting thing that not in the same breath that the religions tell us not to do it they do the exact same thing in other versions or other modalities to tap into the um the unbroken story that you just don't you don't create nothing new if it ain't broken Mm -hmm. so this is we have um a very interesting motif um, that is full of sorcery and full of magic, and it's in the form of the crucifixion of a man named Jesus Christ. Mm. That is a symbolic reference to an act of sorcery whereby which one goes and makes a, a or, oratory request to deity and upon the request, the participant goes and sacrifices a lamb, a goat, and cut into the side of the animal and go and examine the animal's liver and or intestines to find a truism or to confirm a yes or no answer from the deity of question, okay? So through cultural morphology, that lamb became a man. Mm. So Mary had a little lamb. And then when we go look at what is the spear of destiny that they said that the, uh, the Germans were looking for in World War II, they were looking for the instrument of sorcery. This is where the utility of things um, become the representation of deity. So now the spear of destiny, which was used to cut the side of the Christ figure and to do what? And the advancement of examining his liver to see if it had propitious signs or light or dark mark. The light mark means yes mm. in the question and the dark mark means no. Over time, and through co- cultural morphology, our people got associated with the black mark and the liver of the examination. If anyone wants to ex- uh, um, explore this phenomenon, it's, uh, it's called extispacy. You can spell it X-T-E-X-T-I, E-X-T-I, and then the word spicy, S-P-I-C-Y. and You'll find um, several, and this stuff they don't teach you in school Mm -hmm. because to do so, it would uh, almost undermine the the purpose and the merit of what religion is all about, you see? And they wouldn't want you to know that ancient religion is predicated on what we would term divinity. So an act of divinity is whereby which one wants to ask, um, is this a good day to do an interview? or a bad day, and then we would do a divination reading. So, um, um, you see that with sometimes people will have a crystal, mm-hmm. and they'll, they'll do the, uh, the thing, the, 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 the pendulum, mm-hmm. and it'll be over a glass of water, and they'll ask the water as though, 
The water is a receptor. The water acts now as a spiritual device, right? And then so does the crystal. The crystal now is operating the edicts and the truth within the water, you see? So now, the, uh, over time, uh, another, another key, and the, and the extispacy rites were, were, were and still are existing. The, um, the West Africans participated in it. Brazilians do it. Cubans do it. And there was a time where the Romans participated in doing so. And this is how it got to Christianity. Now, do you remember the film, uh, The Gladiator with Russell Crowe? Hell yeah. In that film, there's something very uh, uh, indicative that the, the filmmakers tried to keep it as real as possible with the time period. They were capturing Carthaginian religion. And in Carthaginian religious practices, and I, I know you all remember going to grandma's house when you were young. And grandma used to, if, you know, if she had it, she used to have the salt and pepper mm -hmm. things where it would be the black man and the black woman, right? Yeah. And they were like effigies of, um, I guess you would say, um, uh, Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben's and stuff like that, right? Well, if you go look at that film with the gladiator with Russell Crowe, there's a part where he's praying and he has two effigies. One is male and one is female, right? And he places them in front of the altar and then prays to them. And those were the original uh, effigies used by, by, um, by, by uh, humans to exalt not only themselves in the field of time, meaning they would put the male and the female genders on the porch of time and act as though that they're pillars on the porch and then walk through them into the realm of destiny. So you require, you require for anything to occur magnetically, magically, you need polar opposites. You need gender opposites. You need to find gender in anything that you want to do as well. You have to find it and you have to place them in their propitious areas and then allow the magnetism to bring you to the fulcrum or the focus. So what we have in the form of religion is we have vestiges of all of these tools mm -hmm. that have been suppressed and placed into other um, forms so as to, and I, this is one of my, one of my um, opinions is that the uh, modern, the, the three major religions are, are actually very modern. They, they don't have any ancient import and that, the majority of the proof that I know that they're modern is that there are so many clear indicators that the mistranslation was so rife and so beneficial to slave owners hmm. that all three religions unequivocally all accept the fact that people of color are cursed. Hmm. See? And those are religions that were all utilized to, in fact, create the environment, the very hostile environment that still exists today to justify the, the treatment, the maltreatment of people of color. Hmm. So um, all religions have these elaborate um, modalities and methods in which to try to explain why we are cursed. Hmm. You see? And when I go into the, and this is one of the things that I love to do, I don't like to debate with religious people. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible. You see? They are very, um, uh, for all intent and purpose, I, I understand the need for belief, right? And I would, it, it's almost naive to try to, to try to switch people's belief. Because it might be a thing for them, it, you know. Um, Does belief constitute reality in your opinion? You can, off your belief, do something real in the real field of time. So, yes, it is an anchor for belief. So, to give a positive view of that, I have, God bless her, my aunt passed away, devout Christian. And my aunt never needed a dime, mm -hmm. never needed nothing. And... Houses, Cadillacs, everything. My auntie was good, you know? Traveled to and fro when she went. And when you ask her, 
What's your secret? Her secret is Christ. Mm. But this is my same auntie that when I was destitute and in, uh, in need of help and uh, light in my darkness, she would extend the light that she had within her mm -hmm. that she said comes from Christ to me, a non-believer. Right. And will send me books about how Jesus ain't real. Right. Send me books about the Illuminati and stuff like that because she knew that her, her deity was so strong that it facilitates her having immense love for me despite mm -hmm. me not believing what she believes. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and then it's kind of, belief definitely is necessary because without it, a person's fire extinguishes. Right. right? Many people walk around hopeless because they don't believe in anything. Right. right. Belief is a, a requirement for a man to stand up in this reality. And to, I think it's hardwired in our biology, life. though, that we will create belief systems in the presence of, 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 of unawareness. So humans have this overwhelming ability to use their, their gray matter in this frontal cortex to justify and create elaborate means to understand the circumstances surrounding them. And sometimes if they really brood on certain shit for, you know, for the long time, for the long haul, what it'll occur is they'll, they'll start tapping at truth. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So could you imagine? Yeah, truth that don't require beliefs. Right. Like um, when I speak to um, my brother Oba, and Oba always brings me back to West Africa and the stories. Our religion was an oral tradition of stories. And I'll tell you a story and, mm -hmm. you, and you retain the story. And in the story has rubrics and various things that unlock parts of your psychology. Mm -hmm. And over time, those stories, like uh, mosquitoes buzzing in people's ears, maybe sounded uh, one way to you as a child, but now as an adult, as 19 keys. Right. It has a whole different yeah, connotation. Yeah, because of my experience with the mosquitoes, changes the mosquito symbolism and feeling that I have towards it. Right. So now when I think of a mosquito, I don't think of it without feeling, right? right. At first, this mosquito becomes this character, right? Uh, maybe a messenger, right? Um, to carry a word or to be uh, some usefulness, specifically in this storyline for a child. Now I think of mosquitoes, I might think Bill Gates. Right. Because the mosquito symbolism has all of these new connections based on your experience with it throughout time. Yeah. Right. And so I like the idea of the constant being the oratory tradition. Right. And now we found more means than one. But in word, you are giving somebody a mathematical code. Right. So like like I talked about when I met you, you say legend. Right. Who doesn't want to be a legend? But how many times do you hear that throughout your life or somebody say legend? Even if I meet somebody and I'd be like, yo, I see that. I see that light in you. Right. You one of the ones. You can go your whole life and never hear that. So when you hear that, it can unlock a story for you. That story allows you to create a new narrative in your own mind. Your imagination starts to unlock on what your story is going to be. And now you're activating a belief which starts to have impact on real reality because now you're putting energy towards it and that energy forces it to be real because now you have it in your mind and now you can start putting impact on reality to start changing things up until that belief becomes a heart in reality. So when we can impact year, people with belief, we impact reality at the same time. And the first belief, the first belief that I asked Obama, what's the earliest old dude? and belief of the people. And the first thing was to build you a house. Mm. A physical house? A physical house. Build, put a roof on it. Mm. Things of that nature. And that shows you the power of the cortex that beliefs, your survival, your ability to survive will start creating the infrastructure for your religious practices. Mm. And this is how we got to the real religions that, that um, that has never gone nowhere. Our religions are based off of the things which sustain our ability to exist. Mm -hmm. So um, God is a grain when you go to Mali, mm. when you go to 
um, when you when they speak of the um, potolo, and they say that the grain from the sun star Sirius is where the source of the grain which sustains the people. So the same activity of the grain, how the grain explodes, is very small, and then mm-hmm. it turns into something great, and then it creates a whole field of right. abundance. It's the philosophy of atoms. Right, it, and that is that comes from the cortex and the observer. So you know ancient civilization, this is how you, we know that in order for you to make stuff like pyramids, the people had to have at least 50,000 years of information prior to that. Mm. That brings me to a thought because it's kind of the idea that people marvel at the structure and result of the age of the pyramids, but don't look at the process of all that came before, right, until that age was able to come into brought into existence. It's like a person looking at the age of the internet and technology of AI and being wondrous about it, but not looking at all of the different broad strokes that had to happen before we paint this picture that is present day. Right. So it's like the the real true marvel is the process that accumulates until we get to this point. Our people had observed that the planet was off its uh, axis and they created the pyramids to restore mm. order, gravitational field order. So it must have been a um must have been a war or um or something of that nature, but the 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 um there are there are monuments far older than the pyramids Absolutely. even here in the in in the Americas. Yeah, like um you know Serpent Mound mm. you heard is older than the pyramids. So where's Serpent Mound in Louisiana? Okay, yeah. So you have um you have Serpent Mound, and then you have um and it's propitiously aligned to the uh star system yeah. as well. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So what happens is um, the world suffers when our religions have been stolen away from us. And we witnessed constantly, we've witnessed ever since my childhood, I've witnessed the religious war, never, the religious world never not be at war. Mm. And they're continuously at war because they say people of color are cursed. and there you you because i do believe in curses I, if you believe in the magnetic field you have to believe in curse what is a curse to you ah very because ah. what, <laughs> what is a, a interesting thing to add to that context is the children no longer learn cursive in one today's of the, age. one of the ancient ways to say the word cu- curse is yara mm. or yara yara very harsh language right and it, you, you can you can hear ray you hear light in it. You 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 hear um, and then another one is. And what language was that? Hebrew. Hebrew, which is a wonderful language because it acts as a bridge to ancient psychology. You see, so there are um, nuances in the language that encapsulate the ways of thinking of the ancient people. Mm. So to spread a curse is to spread seeds of dissent. It was a uh, curses. Uh, a farmer will curse you. That's his religion. Mm-hmm. He knows how to spread seeds and all the religions come from that. If you see the death card in tarot, you see the skiff. The skiff becomes an instrument of deity mm-hmm. now because grain is the God. The only way to access grain is to kill God. You have to cut it. This is why I always tell people um, it's very interesting that in the modern era, humans, in particular the African American, has adorned himself with the term deity and God on itself. But the the ancient psychology and adoration of God, they would consume their gods. Mm. You know? And this is one of the reasons why, if you see the the, the cultural morphology prior to the um the the more popular dynastic periods in Egypt, the uh Sutin used to be the head god in the pantheon, mm. a pig-headed deity. When they changed their um their 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 uh catalog of de- deification and changed that and put Osar there, now they not only demonized 
um, the the sutin, they also demonize the consumption of pig. Mm. So if we're not worshiping the pig no more, we can no longer eat the pig. Mm. So sutin name is the root of the word shaitan. So now Islamically, morphologically, Muslims do not eat shaitan because they don't eat pork. Mm. You see? So humans are very, they, they're not problematic in the realm of trying to understand survival. They create some very, very like uh, nuanced ways of, of attributing symbols to things that empowers them over the actual thing. Which is interesting. I mean, but you no, know, symbols are, they have energetic signatures, right? It's like words do. Very good right? term associated. So if you have a negative word, you wouldn't want to consume that word. Right. right. I wouldn't want to speak negative over the food because then that that frequency gets trapped into the food and it can destroy the integrity of an that food of basis. That. An example of that is when years ago, I remember a brother t told me he was going to have a debate with um, some religious figures. And he wanted me to go into the text and speak about this particular part of the Bible that speaks about leprosy. Now, do you remember when everybody remembers when they first came into knowledge of self, you spoke to the elder gods and they was always telling you that the um, pilgrims are descendants of lepers, mm. right? From the disease of leprosy. Mm. That is one of the biggest fallacies ever because when you go read the text in the Hebrew, you'll see that it's an ecstasy right that they're speaking about. That the, that the word gold is associated to something good. So when they say leprosy, they saying, oh, you can see the yellow hairs inside of the womb. They were talking about looking at the golden lining or the silver lining of the intestinal tract. So over time, they, t they make you think that leprosy, oh, it's the disease that deals with lighter skinned people, whites and all that. And all it was was, a mistranslation, but our people never attributed disease to something like gold. We would use gold and ingest it. We would wear gold on our body. We would not say that a wound has gold in it. We wouldn't. We had over a thousand words for just disease, um, oozing, pus, things like that in medical books from Sumer all the way to Egypt. We never would have to use a Bible and say gold was inside of a womb, you see? So we dealing with so much mistranslation, back to what you were saying in regards to energy signatures associated to terms, mm -hmm. we're not going to attribute something that is malefic, you heard? Right. On, it's like when you were but, a child. But, but that's what I was saying to that point. Yeah to not consume something that does have a negative energy signature is an intelligent practice, whether a person is ignorant of the roots and the morphology, you know, that it end up becoming by the time it gets to them. Like that, that brand of water, liquid depth. Yeah. I'm like, hold up. I just read the book with the Japanese brother talking about the power of water. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I don't know if I want right. if I want a liquid death right now. Yeah, you know because I mean? it changes the structure of water. It literally. Does. It does. It's it's like a sigil on the can itself. It does. Um, brother Oba told me yesterday that water has no enemy. Mm. Water will wait you out. Mm. Water will corrode through iron and anything. Yeah. And and a very interesting thing is if we had a family member that unfortunately drowned, it's not going to stop us from drinking water, bro. Mm. You know? So the utility, yeah. utility is the um, utility in design is the, is the mo one of the most amazing attributes that the African has ever, you know, design denotes purpose, has ever introduced to the world. Not only just in the form of things that you can view with your sensory perception, but just the design of spirit in the form of how you process the hierarchy structure of where we are in the universe at large, you know? And we were the best ones to do it. We didn't place ourselves in hells 
um, when no one understands what's going on. It's a fiery hell that's stronger mm -hmm. than this hell, it's stronger than this hell, stronger than that hell. No, we didn't do none of that. We had propitious places to put everything in the fullness of life. Well, yeah, man had a way of understanding all things. And in that, man becomes his own magi, right? The ability to, you know, interpret reality specifically on to self and the collective, right? So if you're, even before, like, we go to names, right? When you have a time where, you know, everything matters, everything you do then is calculated and has to be mathematical, right? right? So therefore, if you have a son, you know, already born that is an emotional son, then you may want a logical one, right? If you have one that is an artist, then you may want to have one that's a warrior, right? Because you may be looking for balance. So then you may name one son, right, based on the tenets or, you know, uh, the, the, the principles of that name for him to grow into that thing, like how a mafia may want a doctor in the family or a lawyer or a policeman or somebody right because the family was the carrier for ruling over time right so i talk about time territory a lot right because we were a time and space rulers but the way we ruled time and space wasn't just with a conquering attitude right you had to be a madman it was through the principles of being able to correctly you know, well, balance out your reality that can carry those, things over those time. Those who conquer time actually are those who honor their ancestors. Well, that's the planetary masters. Like yeah. you talked about it earlier. Being being involved in planetary affairs is a conversation I've been having as a string in some of these. We've lost our master mind, right, in the thinking that it is our responsibility over planetary affairs. So if one is building a pyramid in connection to a star system for the balancing of a wobbled earth, then that is a collective thinking about planetary affairs. Man is only caught up with his personal affairs, right? And he's not good at managing those. So we've lost the idea of managing systems. We manage, uh, that's the, the power class managed systems. We can barely manage ideas in the execution of those ideas. And when we can barely manage people, the labor for the execution of that ideas, and then we can barely manage mind, right? For us to be able to be involved in this entire world within itself. So the, the deepest disconnection that we have for our ancestors is the mastermind and the involvement of planetary affairs. When you go back to, just to establish another point and a dovetail on what we're speaking on, when you go look at... Dovetail, I like that. Yeah, it's better than piggyback. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, we say yeah. veggie back. I like the yeah. dovetail yeah. even yeah. better. We getting fly with it. No question. So the, um, we see a trend, and the, the major trend of all ancient people, the only way that you can actually find these people's... Uh, their behaviors and their religious systems is you have to go to their grave sites, you know? And the grave sites and the majority of the, the places where they say that religion issues forth from, mm -hmm. they, um, they have these terms associated to these areas of these cities, and these cities were called Thels. Mm -hmm. So we have Tel Amara, Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. places all throughout that region. And if you hear the word tell in the beginning of it, it's indicative of a practice of Sumerian people and people of uh, Obeyat. They call them Obeyats. They pre-Sumerian, right? And these people are West African. And I say that these people are West African because they participate in West African belief systems and they were very uh, rooted in uh, which is still today, uh, our people are very superstitious. There's always a meaning behind everything, brother. We never explained away nothing. Everything has a meaning, so, so to speak. So when you find these cities, and these are cities, mm -hmm. these, all of these cities are built on top of ancestors, dead people, purposely, so as to create a connection with your ancestors 
we live with them, right? So now, what happened when those religious practices ceased to exist? And instead of burying or creating cities on top of burial grounds, they started creating temples. So we have that in the form of the Dome of the Rock, mm. the Wailing Wall. That's on the side of Herod's built that wall to maintain the cemetery behind it, which has the ancestors of the ancient period around it. The Dome of the Rock is built on top of ancestral burial ground. But why is there such strife? The energy signatures of the ancestors have, that have not been honored, that are not even acknowledged mm. anymore, that have been cut off from the people. They tell the people, let me, let me catch you. If I ever catch you doing something um, reminiscent of your ancient religion, you're going to die. Mm. You heard? So now you got to centralize your focus of belief onto this nebulous um, deity external to yourself that you will never see, right? And didn't charge it all to the game to him. And then what happens is the world is in muck. The world is in, in, in turmoil because the very connection back to the very thing that keeps the world peaceful, the magnetic field, the very thing that, keep, that, that keeps the natural order of our existence intact is the understanding of our ancestors in their existence that it never dies, that they are a present among us. Like you right now, I'm sitting here with you. Had you the ability to go back 10 people before you who all lived to be at least 95, 100 years old, mm. we only, we're going back only 1,000 years. 10 people from you is 1,000 years. Mm. 20 yous, 19 of you. Mm -hmm. That's 1,900 years ago, brother. Yeah. Mm. Is that a long time ago? Is that a lot of people? No. You see? So you are direct descendant. You might be, you might be very well, the very one of the ancestors back in the day that said, you know what, in any period, maybe let's go post-slavery, you heard? Uh, uh, or pre-slavery like this, you know what? I, this ain't never gonna happen to me again. Mm -hmm. You heard? Never. Watch. And then they did things that live presently inside your, your infrastructure, your DNA. Yeah. So I'm like, that's the time conquest. It is. It is. It is. And then to acknowledge the time conquest is what enamors you with the conquest. Mm -hmm. So real. that's the that's the evolution. Most of our 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 one of our things is our disconnection. Yeah. Right. Because once you disconnect it, whatever happened previous to you does not matter unless that's activated again in another form. Mm -hmm. Right. Meaning that. Yeah, uh, 19,000 years from now or uh, 1,900 years from now, the next 19, 19 keys, right? If they don't have connection to the ideas that's in their DNA, right? The passions, the intellect, the vision that's in their DNA because they're disconnected from their great, 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 great grandfather. They can't evolve upon those ideas and use the resources of their time to be committed to consistently bringing those out to be a challenge or a dominant reality right. in their world. And so that disconnection is where a lot of people may talk about their ancestors, but they don't know them. What was their ideas? What was their thoughts? And you know what? And happened? we get, we, we not to interrupt your wisdom, but we get, we get indoctrinated with everyone else's ancestors, but our own. And, and yes, brother. And the, and the, and the, the thing about that is, Our religion and our very, our existence was predicated on a remembering system, mm -hmm. a system of memory. And that memory is one of the reasons why, if you ever remember your grandmama in the um, famous oatmeal in the mm -hmm. morning, you have no idea how old that recipe is, brother. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But we love, we, we in this generation of things that are new, right? Like a person may say, oh, you ain't saying nothing new, right? Because we've been obsessed with new things versus valuable things. 
New doesn't mean valuable. We have a lot of new shit that ain't worth nothing. Well, we the we the people that the new stuff could actually be fly for because we're kind of like a new thing. You mm. know? We're kind of like a, we were born to be instrument commercial instruments. And um just a few hundred years ago, we were born, we were breeded purposely for labor. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like we have the the shortest um, legacy on the planet in the Western world for actual reading. We don't have a, 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 a we just, it was almost, it was illegal a few hundred years ago. You know? But we did have the, a high literacy rate right out of slavery. Yeah, but I'm just saying, how does this equate to our spiritual practices? Mm. Our spiritual practices were um, totally thrown off. There's no oral tradition there. Right. The, the, There's the no only passing ones, down. Yeah. The only th the only way you can find some of our anthropology is if you're keenly interested in the African American experience and stuff like the Macintosh um shouters. You 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 have uh, in Georgia, you got some brothers and sisters who have slave songs. So in an instance where we're all out sitting up under the tree downtime from working all day with the pilgrim and then one of the brothers will go up and sneak into the um master smokehouse and steal us a piece of meat so how does he know that it's safe we start singing the, the song yeah go dan you don't you don't you run you know what i mean stuff like that i mean know? but shit to this day let's say if a kanye west or somebody puts out a album and they talking the most shit to the system it it, it creates like glimmers, the feeling of safety because it's like, oh, we must be entered a new time. We can say this now, oh. right? This is the time we in and there's somebody saying that, yeah, we can say this now. You feel me now? Let's enter into the house and take what we want. You feel me? It's like, that's why, you know, uh, musicians and people who play in media, you know what I'm saying, get the most smoke from the people because they're supposed to be putting the signals out there to letting us know what time it is. Instead yeah. of they're distracting with their signals, letting the massa know what time it is. Oh, we still got these things under control. Oh, don't worry about it. They still on this type of vibration. But certain times when we hear certain things, it's a signal for those who ready. Like, oh, this playing on the radio. Oh, it's this time for this thing is successful. Oh, this person. Like, we always looking for those signals. And we stop playing in the collective consciousness and start playing in the individual affairs. So therefore, we don't look for the collective to do anything. We look for individuals to do something. The collective was the one singing. The individual was working on the behalf of the collective, right? But the collective and the individual had to work together for the same exact cause. But when we exalt the deities and praise the gods for giving nothing, right? Now we don't get anything for our, you know, uh, uh, definition and our worship. The gods don't give you nothing anymore, right? So. You have to get back to a point where people know how to create collectivism and important size what's good for the collective versus a collective just worship the individual. Now, interesting you say that because um, from a state, statecraft uh, perspective, um, this is a, a elevated conversa conversation, high level conversation. Yes, sir. So, if we were um, participants in statecraft, it would be foolhardy for us to think that the lumpen group, the collective, actually desires to collectively be empowered. No, nah, that's a fact. And that has killed so many leaders speaking on people that don't want no help, no how. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I don't know if uh, people know this, um, Martin Luther King got stabbed in the chest with a fingernail follower mm. prior to getting shot. Oh, uh, 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 a person of color. Yeah. You heard? Tried to kill him. Um, Book for for uh, bringing the collective. People don't notice a religious zealous person killed Martin Luther King Mama. Mm. Okay, 
So the collective is a very dangerous thing if they don't have a cultural iconography. And as you said before, I heard you speak on this, we might look the same, but we got ethnic differences. Exactly. You see? So you find find your tribe season. Yeah. Like some people might have a um a um uh a prolonged journey with and feel disenfranchised and feel like black people need to do this, black people need to do this. I'll be like, I don't know what because, kind of black people you y'all know what? be around. I think it's cause we don't know we don't know how to measure things properly and what the size of a thought needs to be. Right? Sometimes we think too big and sometimes we think too small. Right? So when we think about unity, sometimes we think too big. We need everybody to be on board. Correct. Right? And it's like, nah, let's, 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 let's bring that in. You need about five people. Thank you. Ten people. You can go take over something with you that. You can Wu-Tang them. When they, when, uh, when they want to send you in to destabilize a country, they don't send in a whole army. They do not. They send in a small little brigade of soldiers, maybe like five, ten of them. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, that's not what they're doing. So sometimes... And then we think too small on when we talk about the future and as we talk about planetary affairs. Everybody doesn't have to do the same thing, and that's the whole point. Everybody has this ego of wanting to be a master but not wanting to take any of the actions of the master at all. And it's like, wait a minute. It's okay to admire somebody living in the fullness of their zenith and their potential, but for you to be envious of that is you completely ignoring whatever yours is. Right. That person could have built the plane. You were supposed to goddamn paint it. You were supposed to come up with the design and paint it. But now you so enthralled with the engineer who was able to come up with the design of the plane. You didn't think of how you can add value on top of that design to actually learn what is the best colors. What is the science of what the color we should put in the sky for it? Right. That could have been your contribution. But we have the now everybody has gotten a taste of what it's like to be a worship, right? Social media gives us the taste of worship, right? You get to get liked, you get to get loved, you get to get commented on, you get press, you get media, people share, right? Everybody is being worshiped in a world, whether it's a micro or a macro sense, right? Now the question becomes is what are you worship for, right? So when we give people all this worship and all this love for nothing, right? Then what do I need to do if I can get it for nothing, right? I was always, the, the messenger wrote, you know, we love the devil because he gives us nothing, right? When somebody praises you for vanity, right, that's nothing. What have you done for your look? You were born, right? Now, the development of your mind and the skill set, I can attribute the work, the process, what it takes in order for you to develop that. So now I can calculate your value. I can calculate your strength, right? But people don't know, and we've lost the ability to calculate our true value, our intrinsic value, what we're really worth, because everybody is being worshipped for nothing. And everybody thinks they deserve to be worshipped for nothing because they see somebody else being worshipped sometimes for nothing and or for something. Right. They never there was never a term that they, they always say there's nothing new under the sun. Never said this. But the idea is, yeah, nothing is new under the sun because there's always be nothing in the world. Right. But something is always new under the sun. And that's you and you and your unique signature of what you can do, right, is something new, which is the value of what you can add. So if you add you to the universe, if you add you to this collective pool, now I can attribute what your worth is, right? I can weigh that at the end of your life based on your deeds and your contributions and say, ah, this was the worth of that life. This was what they did, right? And this is what they've added. So going back to being your magi, learning the greatness of you, yeah, you study what is my season? What is my cycle? What type of mind I have? What colors excite me, right? What is the best time for me to move, right? Learning all about yourself. Now you can start putting stuff in your imagination to say, okay, this is what I'm going to bring out because you know what's in you. But school, we don't got a school of mystic arts to where we're trying to figure out what type of person this is to bring out all that they have in them. The teachers don't know the arts. They can't teach you about the best times to move and do, right? They're not trying to give you the basis of what makes you who you are. So there are few people that learn that about themselves. They say, hey, this is me. This is what I'm here for, 
And then the rest get enthralled by that. Wait a minute, you figured it out? Who taught you? The questions you get asked in the interview the most is, what's your journey like? What was that point? Because people are trying to figure out how do they duplicate the process, right, of being your own goddamn magician and bring out your magic? Well, I was through with it before they knew what to do with it. I'm always changing and stitching <laughs> up my shit. I got some that new, there. Yeah, I have a new perspective on life Yeah, that harkens back on the old one in my childlike mind mm. that I had the most beneficial time on the planet when I did not have expectations. Mm. When I just knew it was going to be fun there, I didn't know what kind of fun it was going to be, but I knew it was going to be fun there, mm -hmm. and I was on it. You know what I'm saying? So that's the same thing that we got to kind of generally do in, um, in our world at large, like moving forward. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Entering into the, world, the realm of destiny without actually having expectations as to the outcome. Just knowing that good can only come out of good. And that's right. it. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to get into uh, the Kabbalah a little bit, right? Ah. Just you, you, I, when I was reading something yesterday, the book that I got from you, it was something very interesting, especially, you know, I always talk about the age of AI, the contribution that, you know, A numerical value one, I numerical value nine, the age of 19. My declaration at age of 19 was in 2009 when I made my grand observations on where the world had to go after this period, right? And in that age of 19, it opens up, you know, the artificial world, the artificial insemination, ingredients, artificial imagination, artificial information, right? That is the age that we are in, right? A completely different point in time. I don't believe that there's such thing as artificial intelligence. Mm. I believe that there's only intelligence. And I think that there are various um, tools, but nothing intelligent can exist outside of intelligence. Nothing intelligent can exist outside of it. Outside of intelligence. So and I understand the, that. I understand the I guess the, the question part. becomes is, is it true intelligence if it's only the mimicking of a thing, but cannot how can, produce its own intelligence. How, how, can, how can it not be intelligent if it was intelligently designed? Well, the idea is we brand it as intelligent, right? Based on what we can do, and we attribute we, so those we attributes the, so of look, it copying look, us as so, intelligent. So look, we are the intelligent. Correct. Right? So I go like this. We created hammers, right? Mm-hmm. We created hammers for us, right? Hammers, we could take a hammer down to the zoo with a box of nails and go to the gorilla section. They got hands. They do interesting shit with bananas, right? And leave the box of nails and the hammer there. They're not going to use the intelligent design in the hammer or the nails in the same way that we would. They might start taking their nails and grooming themselves with it. They might start taking it and mm -hmm. scraping off dirt off of things that they eat. They might take the hammer and bludgeon one another when they have what you call it. The, the, aren't those intelligent things to do? I don't think the, it's no disregard whether the systems are intelligent. It's just saying that they aren't what one would consider to be natural or organic intelligence. A hammer is not natural. And it's not natural for you to create a house. Houses are not natural. They're not, well, you're not born with one. You need an ingenuity to do that. Correct. You know what I'm saying? For real. You had to do artifice. Yeah, but that's only the description of something basically that it is, you know, um, artificial. It is not the original. It is not the natural. Ah, right? so very interesting thing you said. So now you said it's not the original. So. That means we live in a world of simulacra. Simulacra. What is simulacra? Simulacra and simulation. Mm, it's a very good book. I got a copy for you. I would love a copy. Yeah. Simulacra and simulation. And we live in a world where we're operating with information. And this, all this information is actually a facsimile of an original finding. Mm. We're all walking around with not the original finding, but a Xerox copy of a destroyed original. And so, you see, 
you know, we may, and that's what I'm saying, like we give machine learning and these algorithms the term artificial intelligence, and we just don't give a lot of other things that we create that yeah. same term. Yeah. It's like that becomes its brand, but it's not the only thing that is yeah. artificially intelligent. Right. And mostly everything we create, I, we I just, just don't put artificial on a lot. No, I like this. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And this is the type of dialogues yeah. that I'm, I'm like, yeah. yo, like what is truly intelligent? Is, is intelligence inherently intelligent? Mm -hmm. And yes, we can create, yeah. we can like- uh, But technical with... versus abstract. I had this conversation earlier. You have technical thinking, which is a technique. I can teach you a technique of how to draw something. You can learn that technique and you draw it the exact way. It doesn't require you to have uh, too much thinking, right? You don't have to come up with your own anything. Just follow instructions, right? The master is more abstract. He comes up with his own way. The slave asks the what? The master wants to know why. The child is the master, mm. right? He has to be turned into a slave mm. so that he can exist in a world of masters and fit in under the construct, yeah. right? So we have a world where a lot of people don't know what to do with things and they no longer have the ability to ask the right questions anymore. Well, I love this conversation because when we talk of Kabbalah, mm -hmm. Kabbalah would be a form of intelligence factorization, mm. whereby which one takes the observed world and places it in all of its factorization sp spaces, locality. Mm -hmm. For instance, when you were a child and mommy bring home groceries, daddy bring home groceries, um, that used to be our job, put the food away. Mm -hmm. And you knew where to put the oranges, you knew where to put butter, you knew where to put canned food. That's what Kabbalah offers in my mind, mm. my Western mind, when I, when I started to delve into it. It's one of my favorite forms of mysticism because, um, because of the tree of life. Mm. The tree of life is a beautiful device, brother. It's an um, it's a, a, a old form of artificial intel, mm. you know? Whereby, which if you can memorize the tree of life, somebody can throw anything at you, anything, like anything, good, bad, you know exactly where to place it. Mm. So I grew up as a young person. Uh, I was gone my whole 20s. Gone. Not going back and forth, like going the whole thing. And then from 15 up to that, I was always back and forth. So I spent a lot of my time uh, and, 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 and the belly, you heard, proverbially, you heard, my thought process did not coalesce into a high level of understanding until I started getting the factorization systems in, in order. So what do I do with anger? What do I do with resentment? What do I do with grace? You get, you, sometimes you get these feelings where, oh, I feel so grateful, so graceful. You can still squander that if you don't know where to place it. Mm -hmm. So that's what the tree of life did for me. It gave me parameters to understand the infinitesimal mm. reality. Right. And I know that's a paradox. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I, I like that because I think that's what good systems do. Yeah. It lets us know, it gives us a way, yeah. right? What we often don't have in modern day is like, like a samurai has a way of doing things. Yes. Yeah. Right. There's a way he has to do everything because everything has a meaning. It goes back to a mathematical people, which is a numerical people, right? So if you walk in, there's a way you put your shoes. There's a way you fold. And then you ask him why, and he's going to be able to explain why, right. right? Energetically, he's going to be able to explain emotionally, psychologically. This is the why. So if he's dealt with a burden, he knows the way to deal with that, where to put that, where to place that. Right. So there's like this feng shui. Right, right, of dealing with life and where to place all these things. And we're at this place where our mind is messy because we don't know where to put things. And that was the thing that plagued me. I had an inability to place my reality in the locations that it required mm. me to have a, uh, a unfolding narrative. And one of the first introductions to consciousness that I ever received, it was, shout out to my brother, his name was Fahim from Queens. Mm. From, he used to cut here in the Coliseum. And he introduced me to this book called, by James Allen called As a Man Thinketh. 
And he introduced it to me with the book as well as the audio so I could hear it on tape and then read it. And you would think that I would change my life just after one reading. But what happened was I remember returning to the free world. I'm like this. This is when I was young. Go home and I'm going to tell everybody about the power of the mind. Meanwhile, they all selling crack and shit. You heard? And niggas like, yo, you're bugged out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I get it, bro. Well, you know what yeah, because their money isn't destroying the mind. Yeah. You know, they like, all right, bro. Yeah, sounds good. You know what I'm saying? And then I got discouraged and I was like, ah, all right, I know that. But yeah. now let's get back to it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then now I had to go get an upgrade to that book. Then mm -hmm. I went and got me another one. Um, Thinking in Destiny. And that was the book that helped me galvanize wholeheartedly that I would not return back to the penitentiary. Mm. That I was like, I'm done with that. I don't want to be nobody's jailhouse genius or none of that. You heard? I'm good with that, mm. for real. And um, it helped me to kind of low-key despise the mind of the street person. It's a lazy person, especially with the advent of the internet. We got all of this knowledge about, about our place in the world, the diaspora and everything. Mm -hmm. There's no excuse for us to still have the quote unquote proverbial street nigga, mm. you know? So I stopped participating totally in honoring and venerating that dead world where them brothers are in need of true honor that they've never received. They mm -hmm. do, they're still grieving. That's a world of grief. Right. That's a world full of grief, the gangster world. You're continuously grieving your um, lack thereof and then the loss of your friends and, and your family as a result of the, of the lifestyle. Well, yeah, it's a reverse reality because you're not living forward, right? You're not thinking too far. And most of it is dealt with the past. That's where all that trauma is. There was a study that came out to say you can burn as much calories watching a horror film than you do in a 30 minute walk, mm. right? So a person sitting there yeah. and you getting that fright or flight and your metabolism is happening, your adrenaline is, is going through a rush. And you can understand how a person would be burnt out by the end of the day being in traumatic or uh, living in fear. You don't have enough energy for anything else. Wow. You felt like you actually did something the whole day. All you did was live in your fears. That's right. Right? And so, you know, in the advent of like, when you see the rise of horror in our culture and in society, right? There, I'm sure you can see a decrease in a correlation between our productivity, mm. right? We don't do a lot of things to optimize design in our society. And I, I like to stop calling it culture so much because the goal is not to just create a culture, it's to create a society, right? Like even if the word is not encompassing of something big enough, like if we say our civilization or our empire, it is speaking to the prophecy of what we want to have. Yeah. We only got past to the point we want a culture, right? That's it. We don't have nothing past having a culture. What when we talk about our economy, I think a culture we're not is going enough, far. Though, if we call culture, culture, culture as a basis, yeah. But you gotta have a goal for the basis of the thing you build. Right. You know what I mean? Like what are you building a culture, culture for? I want a culture reminiscent and um, similar to, not to be trivial, but like Chinese people, bro. We need to move like the Chinese, bro. Uh, we could go to, um, you know, brothers risk their life right now to go someplace to go buy some narcotics and try to sneak it back somewhere. Mm -hmm. We can go to Shenzhen, China, bro. And as soon as we get there, just be out on the street with street vendors and create an existing technology right there and have it in production in 48 hours. That's a fact. But you see, there, there. And, and, and my point is. And, but Shenzhen wasn't always like that. They I know changed it was their a culture. Town. Yes. And they, they improved it because they want to participate in the financial world. Exactly. Yeah. So they had a, a point of, they didn't just shift it, they shifted it because they had a place they wanted to arrive to. Yeah. Right? Like they wanted to be, you know, they wanted to increase their quality of living. They wanted to, of course, have wealth. They wanted to play in the future. 
to where they can be a major player to build out their city. So it was like they had a culture already. Yeah. Right. But now what would be the point of shifting things in our culture? Because our culture will ultimately now, produce the, our reality. But, but what is the mode out like? Not not to ask a question or. or no, you can ask the conversation. Even, yeah. Not even sound like I'm like, you know, a lot of African-American males in particular. They think a conversation is going against each other. No, no, you no. That's a cipher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm of the mind that they. Their greatest asset and their greatest utility is the fact that they will share the technology. Mm. And if you're my cousin, right, I'm not going to wait for you. You're standing there with a lighter and I'm standing here trying to light something with a flint. You're not going to wait for me to get a trademark or graduate from school to say, yo, bro, you ain't got to do that no more. Mm -hmm. Come with me over here. We took the little piece of the flint. We put it in this lighter thing with this fluid and pow, you mm -hmm. got a lighter. America, they'll let your ass sit there, bro, and sit there with a flint and be laughing at you. Make a sitcom out you. Yeah, that's like, a look fact. at him. Look at Fred Flintstone. Well, that's we, what they're doing. We like sharing our failures of each other more than the successes of each other. But right. that goes back to the I individual. Right. With, if, if we cared about collective, then I wouldn't want to share your failures because then we would reflect badly on me as well. Right. But when we're no longer reflections of each other, right. then we don't care how you reflect it. Right. Now, we don't realize is that you may not care, but the rest of the world still grades you as a collective. Right. They don't grade you as an individual. They say your people. And then you are now graded by the reflection of the advancement or the detriment of your own people. So there's no way to disconnect from that. And then when you do disconnect, then you're going to be disrespected by other people to say, like, how can I respect you if you don't respect your own people? Right. Because there's nothing you can do to actually disconnect because the blood already runs in you. Right. Right. The story is already in you. You already have a people. Right. You already have a culture. It's just do you want to go rebuild it or build a new forward one? Do you want to protect it, maintain it? Right. Everybody in the world can understand this idea of collaboration. And we we are getting, I would say, we're getting better at it just to think for, right? But our biggest issue is collab competitive capitalism yeah. and the scarcity idea that there's not enough for each of us. So you don't want to share your match because you feel like there's a scarce amount of matches, not in the world, but for black men, right? right? So now if I share it with another black man, maybe I don't get another match. But you don't mind sharing it with somebody who you know is an abundant thinker and have their own. Today's episode is brought to you by Goldwater and Crown Society. You know, we pay the bills by making sure that we can pay ourselves. And every time you all assist and every time you all buy product, this is how we're able to thrive, right? The Goldwater is not just the gold. We also have all of the other nootropics that we utilize to keep the body stimulated. It's hard for you to retain information that myelin not operating is not electrical in that thought. That's because you need to feed the body the right thing for it to operate at its highest level. Me, I'm going to need that gold water before we get started. I'm going to need that lime mane and that smart moss. I'm going to need that crown Z oil, right? I'm going to need all of the components that allow me to function at a high level. And then, of course, the God body is going to put on one of these crowns and we're going to step outside looking like the gods that we are. So make sure y'all go to goldwater.com and make sure y'all go to crowns19.com. We got new glasses, we got hats, we got scarves. We got a whole collection for the guys. Make sure y'all tap into the garments and the customization is on the way. I know y'all see me with the threads and I know y'all fed up with me not giving y'all that. So don't even worry about it. You will be able to go on there, type in your customizations and we're going to have that made for you. More information coming soon. Y'all continue to stay tapped in. Let's get back to the conversation. See. The, the one thing that I, I've learned about wealth and wealthy people is, you know, a lot of times they don't want to be the one that make you wealthy, but they don't mind adding to it. Right. Right. If you have nothing, they don't want to give it to you. Number one, you may not be a good steward of your own life. So why is the point you have nothing in the first place? Right. And why am I adding to somebody who's irresponsible with the gift of life in the time that we're living? No, I want to add to the world of more people like me. Right. Because if I give somebody who's irresponsible something, then I feel irresponsible because I'm enabling you at this point. But if I give it to somebody who's building, who's wealthy, who already has power, 
adding to people who like me. Oh, you power, you got power, I got power. Shit, I don't mind getting you more power then, because you already got it. It don't even mean as much to you. And and the beauty of our cultures, to harken back on that term, right, is that if you go to the continent, that you can't find a Picasso when you want to go buy art. Mm. You can't find a Caravaggio. You find art from Mali, mm-hmm. Kenyan art. Gambian art. Mm-hmm. And the reason being is because you're born in the culture and instructed on how to profess the culture in the means by which we express it. Mm-hmm. So you're taught how to make the effigy, how to make the mask, how to wear the mask, right. how to curate and explain it. So you're using the same design and the same engineering and the utility of um, spiritual technology mm-hmm. that is ancient, and now you're able to pass it on. And so we can. When, so I go like this when we say we, because we is a French term. Yeah. We means yes. yes. <laughs> right? So I go like this. Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes, you yes, feel yes. me? <laughs> so I'm like, um, there, there's a period of time where um, people need self help motivation. On an individual level, they need mm-hmm. they need a, they need a persona or someone that they can see do something amazing right. and miraculous, and vicariously live through that person. Mm-hmm. But what happens when you empower the person? They feel empowered, but they don't have a skill given to them based off their culture. Mm. How you going to eat with your skill? So I was. That let them tell it our skill. When you see us, every if we go outside right now with you like this, fresh to death, you oh, these guys is rappers. Some of them is rapping. They get into the bag too. Look at them. Yeah. Right? They got the camera like this. Oh no, maybe they um an actor or something. He in a hood movie. Or they play ball. So you think my vocation is my culture. Mm-hmm. See? My vocation might be. My vocation might be um, uh, enhanced because my culture tells me that I should keep an ancestral shrine. I should stop giving flowers to living people and give flowers to my dad. Mm. I should stop giving a damn about celebrities and what celebrities did, did some salacious celebrity stuff to another celebrity. And I don't even know my third great grandmother name. Mm. I can't even call on my grand great grandma. Mm. I don't even know her name. Mm. Or nobody could even tell me my date of birth. Damn. You heard? So I'm like, our true vocation, our true religion. Damn, you know that you, you said something. Most people don't know each other, like you said, don't know each other date of birth, right? And we really have little information on each other when we really think. We know how we feel about each other and we know the emotional connection we have to that relationship and partially the value of that, right? What that could possibly contribute to us. But if I know, let's say, you know, your your astrology signs, your birthday, your personality type, your human design, I'm talking about everything that makes you who you are, it forces me to be empathetic with your design and also what the value of you are and where you fit in my life. I could be trying to ask you to do something that goes into the friction of your character, right? So when we walk around ignorant of each other, because we always talk about having self-knowledge, but what about knowledge on your family? What about knowledge on your friends, right? The FBI, CIA go keep a foul on you. If we have fouls on our family and friends, we'd be solid. How much we tell the computer. Mm. The computer know all that. That's the best friend. What you talking about? Bro, well, a part- the- yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go, you gonna notice if your phone missing quicker. You gonna notice if your friend missing. Yes, yes. How long your friend missing? Forty eight hours. Because if they ain't called you, that's how you right. know. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they gotta talk to. You. They gotta go through this first. Right. Then I'm gonna realize that they've been missing. Right. Right. Because if this is missing, that's your number one priority. Because you're not used to in-person communication and what that creates is we can be more distant with each other because we feel connected through this and we, portal. And when we go back to statecraft and we go back to this, I'll be like, everything ain't for everybody. Mm-hmm. I don't belong to no conscious community. Mm. I'm beyond conscious. 
Yeah. Do you know I said you know, that a fly for a while? Is conscious, man. A butterfly mm. conscious, a roach is conscious. Right. Anything constitutes. You can't put me in a community that anything could be conscious. Right. Everything can't be co cosmically inclined. Mm -hmm. You heard? And, and it, it, it's a community that practices, you know, endocannibalism. It eats itself. Oh, all right? brother. All day long. Brother, let me tell you something. I've been doing this for the longest, King. I have been doing this for the longest. I was producing, me and Blue Pill mm -hmm. was producing Blue Pill just hit me up. lectures, bro, <laughs> yeah. in 2003, 20 years ago. I wasn't even in the free cipher. He was mm. my point man. Mm. We kidding it. I'm, I'm writing books to sell retail, and I'm not even there, bro. Mm -hmm. You feel me? So I've seen this. I'm talking about early teachers, my early teachers in them back in the day, I, I despise the fact that I seen that these tapes that I'm listening to mm -hmm. in, the, in the Jones, Black Dot, shout out to Black Dot, sending me these tapes. I'm listening to these tapes, and this brother Phil Valentine has changed my life, bro. Yeah. Bobby Hemmett changed my life. Delbert Blair changed my life. I said, I'm coming home. And I'm a soccer to their pocket. Mm. And that's word to everything I love. Word to my mother. I did that. You know? I changed my teachers sitting up, um, had to ask people for donations, passing hats around for the donation. I said, no, you got me fucked up. We're not doing that no more. That's over. So I'm like this. My teachers went from what you call it to $4,500 to $10,000 to talk, brother. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Like this. I'm like to, I'm one of the first people to bring Phil Valentine and Bobby Emma together after they had not done nothing in the same room for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, nobody brought Delbert Blair to New York because $1,500 was too much money at the time for his lecturing fee. Could you mm -hmm. imagine, brother? There's people walking around with $3,000. Oh, for sure. Oh, no, I know for sure. Because cause we, want, we want slaves. As much as people talk about slavery, People yeah. want slaves. Yeah. They want you to do something for them for nothing just because they want you to. Yeah. Right? They want to control your will and your mind and definitely don't want to pay you for anything or try to contribute and figure out a way to give you value equal to the value that they've gotten. Oh, right? Yeah. We want people to work for us but never want to work for others. Right. right? And I think that that goes to the fact that we don't actually want to work for God. We want God to work for us. The other thing is people don't got that, that self-value and then... You could live your whole life trying to be accepted and enamored by this community, a community mm -hmm. of nebulous community of people that you don't know. But you be living your whole life sitting up trying to circumvent comments that people mm -hmm. make on the internet, of people that you never met and or never will see. You know the cold part about it? You in your entire life. Is, is, it's the whole black dot on the white shirt. You know what I'm saying? 99.9% .9 of that shirt can be clean. That black dot goes steal your attention. Yeah. Right? Because you're not appreciative of all of the space that still is clean. Right. Right? All you can focus on is this speck. And maybe nobody can see it, but you're conscious of it. Right. So it robs your attention. It steals it. And that's what people try to do. Those people, a lot of times, that they have evil intent. They want you to see a word. They want to ruin your day. They want to control you. And it's like that kind of goes to Kabbalah. It's like when... Sometimes I tell them a lot of times I don't open a lot of DMs or messages and letters that people send me because I don't know what spell they want me to be under. They could say something that they want to ruin my day. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know what consequence that you want from my observation. Oh, so man. I, I want to observe it. Today, a nigga <laughs> offended me today. Yeah. And just told me to send him my phone number. Like, I'm that type of nigga, man. Like, I'm just like a free-for-all type of, like, I'm just on the internet for free. Like, I yeah. just, I'm just playing on the internet. Like, I want to be seen. I don't really want nobody to know me mm -hmm. like that. No, you are a very behind-the-scenes person. A brother, I could really be on some other shit if I wanted to, but I don't be doing that. Man, so, so, so tell me if we kind of switch gears a little bit, man, because you do operate in hip-hop. You know what I'm saying? I see you with Benny. I see you with the Fly Gods and everything. And in that space, you know, it's, it's knowledge in they rap. You know what I mean? It's knowledge in yours. So, you know, what role do you play in front of the scenes and behind the scenes? You feel me? As far as the value that you add to hip-hop space. Well, that's an interesting question, but 
I say that I, in regards to gunning them, I um, I am. If somebody, if I was a fan, I would be. I would would. I would be what you would want to. If you was the artist, you would want me to be your fan, your favorite mm. fan. Because when you're not there, or you're not looking. I'm trying to get everybody I know that has an ear and that could do something significant to listen. And that's, that's a track record for me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's proven already. My ears are golden. Yeah. I don't listen to garbage music. I cut it off. In fact, I'm so good at it, I can listen to a song for all of three seconds and tell that shit is trash. Yeah. I promise you. And I'm trained too. One of my trained people, um, Ice Pick J, God bless the dead. My brother Ignatius, you heard? Jackson, legend, you heard? And my mother and my father. Uh, and my true background is actually in jazz music. So I just, I love music, period. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So what I contribute is, um, I got five placements in Scorpio. I just celebrated my 49th birthday mm, Monday. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm sitting there like, it's, it's not too much a person could tell me. 49 mm -hmm. years on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Almost same age as hip hop, man. Man, and I've been around Miles Davis. I've been around Art Blakey. I've been around greats you yeah. know, in the field. Branford, Winton, Marcellus. And I seen a lot, Spike Lee's and all of that. And uh, um, the, the, even the, um, the red and the blue pill will tell you our parents were damn near a and R's. We've seen them introduce um, uh, musicians to these other great musicians mm -hmm. and stuff like that and create. And that is a cultural practice as well. I always want to be in the company of arts. So when I get around my brothers like that, I don't sit up around artists in the hip-hop realm and i don't talk about street shit i don't care mm -hmm. about what's going on in the internet i don't care who's a gorilla who think they tough or who's a thug none of that you you feel me i'm more concerned um with uh aesthetics the uh composition the the, the dialogue mm -hmm. of of composition and stuff like that and then just enhancing my overall acumen and the ability to um because the art is unequivocally a tool of ours. Mm -hmm. We can utilize art to do far more. You can do stuff with art. In fact, the actual handgun that people use is an instrument that by far that and the toilet mm. are super art instruments. The toilet does not look like something that you do that on. That's one of the greatest artistic contributions yeah. to humans. You heard? It doesn't look stanky. Yeah. You feel me? So that's one of the greatest How does things. one go about designing that type of thing? Because you, 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 you're the juxtaposition master, right? Putting these two opposing but complementing things that forces the mind to feel, I think, two things at once. Well, it, it takes this. You have to be, you have to be, you can't be afraid to do to put two things in the same place. One of my famous uh, prints that I did, I don't really do it a lot because it, it um, sometimes it can create some negative connotation, negative feedback mm -hmm. from people who don't understand. I did a, a print about 10 years ago called The Messenger. And I did it because there was a news report that said that the gun that killed Biggie Smalls wound up in Chicago, mm. right? And I was like, wow, on Stony Island, you mm -hmm. heard? So I said, wow. I said, that's interesting how this, um, how that just played out, right? So it's an image of Biggie Smalls that I cut out and ripped and placed on top of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm. And I called it the messenger. And then at the bottom, I had 
stenciled like um just two pistols facing each other, you know? And I no longer have them. They sold immediately. But the dialogue that it created was like, wow. Like, why? Like, what is that, bro? You know what I'm saying? My other one, everybody knows uh, Aleister Crowley. Mm -hmm. But everybody don't know Whoopi Goldberg. But ironically, for some reason, well, this she's in the movie yeah. like this with her hands like this, mm. and he has a famous picture doing the same thing. Mm. So I put his hat on her head, and then like this. I sold so many of those, bro. Those shirts, that design saved my life so many times. Take care of my baby and all that. You heard? I've sold that design, licensed it to one of my homies that was big in crypto. $10,000, brother. Mm. Paid a long time ago. You heard? So that's my spiritual technology. My spiritual technology exists without me actually having to be there. And that's what I'm doing with all due respect. Let me finish. That's what I'm doing with my designs is that my model in this respect is that what if I was the one that made up McDonald's and I made it up, I made up the menu, I made it up and it's delicious to people, right? But I don't have the resources to facilitate the billions of burgers that is going to be sold the next day all over the world. So I licensed the M's. I licensed this menu. And I don't care where you go get the what you call it from. As a matter of fact, um, I'm going to do the commercials and then y'all just buy the, all of the equipment from here. All you got to do is get the building. And I got everything else. So now McDonald's don't have to sell burgers no more. They just sell the, 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 the joint and then y'all buy the salt everything for me. Mm -hmm. That's it. So this is what I'm like with my designs. That's how powerful my designs are. I want to be like, to me, I'm very impressed by the Supreme, the model. It, it, um, them and Ralph Lauren are very similar to me in that they're both resellable. You can walk out of it and might depreciate if you wear it or whatever, but some items don't depreciate. Some items are with value added on to it. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to wear a garment, right, you would want to wear a garment that if anything happened, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm, but we, n Brooklyn niggas is notorious for like, nigga, you want this sweater? You like this sweater? Here, I'll sell it to you, nigga. I got three, four, seven of these shits in the crib. <laughs> yeah. For real, here. You feel me? Like that. So I'm like, my spiritual technology is retail. I need, to, I need the soccer tree. I promise you, I, I require it to stay in the free cipher and to, st and to maintain my level of civility. You know what I'm saying? I got to be, eat, um, fat God cannot be hungry. Yeah. You feel me? It's not so, a so good look. In the, the, the design aspect, uh, it's, it's something that we actually see in the world a lot, I feel like, but we don't notice, right? These things that invoke these multiple senses on different layers for different reasons, we don't know why, right? Really good art makes you feel something, whether you know why or not, right? right? It just makes you feel, and that connection becomes the metric for value of why I want that art, right? And so what I hear when you create That's this one thing, though, there's some there's some garbage. Art yeah, thing, but you know, there's the there's, equity, there's it's layers the, to it. It's yeah. The equity of the artist and their um, depending on which art world you're in, because if we was to do a hundred of the world's top artists, mm -hmm. we would know none of the first 70. Yeah, but those are. Those are businesses and cultures built into that and ways that people, but I'm just speaking generally of just yeah. art, period, yeah. right? Like man feels something about what he sees and then that's art. So it's like you can't tell somebody what art is and what's not if a person feels a way about it. If right. art makes you feel nothing, and maybe that could be the art itself. It's that you look at something and you stop it, feeling anything. It, it's not. It right? Be, it, but, good art is catharsis. It should make but, you feel but, dis, discomfort. But, yeah. Most something. art makes you think. It makes you feel. It taps into emotional cores because they're symbols. 
But with the juxtaposition, these are like, you know, art flowing in one direction and then it goes to the other. And it's like two opposing forces in one. And you probably can never settle into the why. Right. right? And that becomes such a powerful thing because the art of living is feeling. Yeah. Right. The experiences that we have are to feel. So art becomes this experience. You can watch, look at it a billion times. And you get an experience each and every time. Yeah. And that's why art will always be valuable. And if most people can figure out how to create, I'm a just position myself, right? I started off, you know, uh, stacking these different elements together that normally are not seen, right? And so then I create a value because there's a feeling attached to that, like, oh, we don't get to see it like this. But when you can, it's, it's easy to maintain that when you being true. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it's being real. Like for me, when I hear you creating something, it's not just for the point of polarization. It's the discovery that you want, you know, to live forever. Right. And it's discovery of, I felt something in the thought and I'm going to create the thought and that thought then evokes something in others, whether it's forbidden, whether it's sacred, whether I should or whether I shouldn't, it's not really the factor of the why, or maybe it is. But either way, that creates the value. Right. And I think more people in their creation of their arts have to create things that have meaning. And the, the, the world is losing its design. It's losing its color. It's losing the art of things because everybody's going into imitation. That worked. It'll work for me. Right. And so we get a billion copies and no original. Mm. And so getting back to the world of the originals, you know, I was always taught the, the we are the original man. Right. So if I go back to that core of who I am, I need to do things original. I don't feel like I'm living. Even if you give me something, I need to make it mine in some sort of way before I use it. Right. Otherwise, I'm using yours. That's why I use a juxtaposition um, to make what is prevalent and people take for granted in their face all the time. Mm -hmm. I make it my vision of it and I put it in my purview of how I see it. Like every time I see the leader of North Korea, mm -hmm. I just think of how, like it's a it's like a parody on like he want all the smoke. Yeah, that's all I think. Like, so yeah, that's I, a so fact. I, I made I made a design. Yeah, him called the um, and I used I always use a third force. You heard, which could be a key phrase. So I used Stevie Wonder, Rocket Love. Mm. He got the song Rocket Love. So I'm like, mm. North Korea, homie, he loved them rockets. He had parades, showed them people what rockets he got, and he always threatening people. Yeah. So like, if y'all play with me, I'm going I'm to press the button. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I got hundreds of these, bro. Like, so many of them, it's ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? It's funny because I think we, we get to see more of that as people play with AI to create these just wild thoughts in their mind. Yeah. Right? I, and, but you know what? I'm t I tried it with AI. Like I, I seen this picture years ago before AI even came out. I mean, the the for domestic, I mean, you know, regular use, right? Uh-huh. Well, because I'm I'm sure it's been out for years. So it was a picture of a dude jumping out of a fighter plane into like parachuting into the sky full of killer sharks. Mm -hmm. Right? So I had used the image for an event I did in um in Chicago, and I put in the um, like you know, like the little blurb out of the mouth of the the the, the soldier saying to the other one, "Don't get scared now, nigga," like that, right? So when the AI thing came out, I went to the Mid Journey, right, and I learned about prompting, bro. Yeah, I, yeah, prompting it is took the me future. So much prompting to get similar of what I wanted. Okay, and yeah. I learned a lot about the Markov models. So I wrote about Markov models in my book, about hierarchy structures, how artificial intelligence, like our first introduction to kind of artificial intelligence is if I keep texting you and I keep using the word um, nigger and the phone says nugget, right? After a while, it's going to start spelling nigger. So you know it, the spell check mm -hmm. is spelled correct. 
was automatically inundating itself with that. So the hierarchy was teaching the the instrument mm -hmm. that this is what the person means. Right. This is the 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 output from the input that we want, the cause and reaction. Right. So with the the AI, you could put a famous person in there because there's so many impressions right. up there of them. You could like, oh, let me see Michael Jackson fighting Mike Tyson boxing. Oh, it's so funny. You heard? But is it, is it, is it culturally enlightening is my thing. See, some art, this is the beauty of art, is that, like, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure, and this is, a lot of people are going to see this, but our brother, I cannot stand, like, I literally, I think they, I think these should, people should be considered domestic terrorists who make paintings of Mickey Mouse and fucking Daffy Duck, bro. You heard? I just promise you that shit. I hate that shit, bro. <laughs> I, I really despise it. It should be some um, laws against you, motherfuckers. Mm. You know what I mean? I like mean, that. there are some copyright infringement laws. Not even the copyright infringement. There's no social value in an exploding Bart Simpson head. You heard? I don't want to see that. That's not art to me. You feel me? So it's so, it's like, it's so questionable what art is. So I'd be like, art should have dual meaning. On one face, it should say something, but then on the other, it should but say something But every time you else. put rules on art, the art is going against those rules, which is why art can never truly be defined by, you know, a societal standard, right? Because everybody has a different experience on what evokes an emotion from them. So the moment that you say art needs two layers, then people want to only create art with one layer just to be counter what the standard is, which then becomes a new art. Art is, if art is so spiritual and emotional, you know, when we feel something, we want to interact with that feeling. A person says AI is not real art. Guess what? It's going to make so many people do AI art, right? Because they want to be counter that feeling, right? Because the whole idea of it, like we're in the age you talk about prompting of clarification. Good leadership can clarify, right? I can communicate exactly what I mean. The idea today is only as good as the clarification. So if I'm talking to a human being or talking to an AI, my ability to clarify and the range of what language this person that I'm talking to or machine I'm talking to understands to then get the output I want. That's the value I have as a leader and yes. or now as an artist. Yes. So today's art, the problem is everybody knows technique, but they can't think for self. They can't abstract their own ideas, right? So we can do what we're told, but when we have to do something the way we want to do it, we don't know how. So everybody is looking to be told what to do instead of figuring out how, how to use. What are the thousand ways to use it? Not what the creator told you it was for. That doesn't matter. What is the way you want to use it? Because now the creative is the creator. As a postmodernist, I like postmodern art mm. in that I, I make the art and I don't explain it. It's postmodern art. It's for the viewers. I've seen that ex they say explanation kills art. It does. It does. But some, some art requires curating. But some art requires curating, especially when you're in the company of the intelligentsia and the people who are philanthropic who know that the financial value attributed to the art mm -hmm. is, is, is another aspect of the art in itself. You know what I'm saying? Because anybody can do a lot of them paintings, bro. The paintings, like literally, you don't have to, like, oh God, when people start crying about AI, it'd be non-artists crying about it. Right. People that never painted nothing in their entire life are worrying about other people. You heard? And Which, at, at this point, everybody's an artist if they want to be. Because yeah. the, the art that's created from the feeling is the art. Not the technique used to create the art being the art. But what's valued today with a lot of artists, hey, I'm a graphic designer and I have these skills to utilize Adobe. So therefore, this ability to create this art should be cherished versus the art being created itself being cherished. Yeah. And today, people are like, nah, I had to pay you to get my idea out because I didn't have your skill to be able to utilize this medium to get the idea out, which you consider to be the art. But the value wasn't your ability to produce it. It was in the time 
before there were new tools, but now the ability, the value of the idea of creation itself. Yeah. So the end result. And what people have to learn to do is not make the AI the end result. Once the AI is done, it is now part of, and you have to have, like you say, the third force or another element on top of that, which then makes it original. But if you don't add anything to it, that's when I personally feel that art is robbed of any real, you know, tr true spiritual value. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I did want to get back to Kabbalah before we end this off. So it was, it was something that you said that prompted this thought. Okay. Right? Uh, you were talking about the, the expression before the word, right? Like, what was water? How was water expressed before the word water is expressed? The need for water being expressed, mm. right? You know why I bring, why I bring that up? It's because oftentimes people define something holy with a term. Mm. And they think that the term that you're defining it with right. is the end all and be that all it, to That it. the term is sacred itself. Right. But and it's that's not. What, it's just an expression of the deity it, or the frequency right. being expressed, specifically in whatever language you can express it. Right. And then the value of that, as I was looking, it's like, all like, right. Look at the word in Spanish for work. Mm. Trabajo sounds like a party. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you want to go. Or like a liquor. Trabajo. Yeah. Yeah. It's lit. Right. <laughs> but work sounds like slavery. Yeah. He likes work. But that's a that's another Work thing. Like is that shit you got to do all day. Our connotation to things, right, is how we regard the value of them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because work is just exertion of energy. Everything requires work. But when we think about work in connotation to having to do things that you're demanded to do to live on this planet, it's way more than the word work. It's the systems behind work that we connect the feeling to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which gets me to my point. Like, you got a number right, which is one frequency turned into a letter, which then turned into a word, which can house a meaning, right, which can house a variety of ideas, then it becomes a phrase, like right? Like, for instance, the first I wanna, word in I the wanna, Bible. I want to get to the, let me, let the me first just. first word in the Bible equals a number. Yeah. And go ahead. No, I'm sorry, King. I'm <laughs> good. I'm good. <laughs> no, you know what? They always say I interrupt people, so I'm sure they're going to be happy I'm getting my medicine today. You feel me? No, so it goes from number to letter to word to phrase to verse, right? To paragraph, to page, to chapter, to text, to book, and then to movie, to and movie and to song. To beginning, to end. And each one of these house a, a, a level of um, energy in each one, right? The ability for you know, man, to be able to take a word and say, here's the energy. And I can say one word to you and it can have meaning. I can give you That's a phrase of that can unlock you. I can give you a book that can change your reality forever. I can show you a movie, which are moving words and texts and ideas and symbols. And all of that is unlocking and encoding something in you. I can give you a song, which is the rhythm of that same thing, making you emotional, same way the book or anything else can do. Right. And Today, we just have more of the movie and the song than we have the word, the verse, or the text, right? Religious people use more of verses than anything to get you into the rhythm of faith, right? But people who want to distract you use more of the song and the movie because they believe that these are much stronger because it activates so many different parts of you, right? So how does, how does man go from the creation of number getting to movie and his evolution of, you know, mastering reality. Well, when the first letter in the Bible is a word and the first letter in the Bible is a word and the first letter is a word and the last one is a word too. But the letter, what is the first letter of the Bible? What's the last letter of the Bible? And that's a super lesson. Mm. The first letter is the letter B, and the last letter is the letter L. And the first letter, the letter B equals 2, and the last letter equals 30. Mm. And the number 32 is the amount of teeth every human should have. And when you add 3 and 2 together, it equals 5. 
And when you're five, you lose your front first two teeth. The planet is on a two, three axis ratio. If you drop something from a high level altitude, it speed at three, two, it, it registers. That number is a overall register, right? And it means lub, lub, L and B, or bow. You've heard that before, mm -hmm. bow, right? But when you reverse bow, the god, another name for Marduk, bow, and you reverse it as lub, that's where you get the word love from, mm. at the center. How do you if get 32 out of L? So lub is how you say heart in Hebrew. So we say the word love and attribute love, right, in English to the heart. But love in Hebrew is ahiba, right? So ahiba, so now I'm giving you sounds which are function. So when you hear a heart and you put your thesoscope on it, mm -hmm. it go ahiba, 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 ahiba. It's the beating. And, it, and it's a tetragrammaton, ahiba. Ahibahi. Same as Yahi Vauhi. So then they made Yahi Vauhi the centerpiece and the deity construct called Yahweh. But Yahweh equals Yah 10. 10 plus 5 is 15. 15 plus 6 is what? 21. 21 plus 5 is what? 26. So your listening audience, if they didn't know this, 26 is a number that does something that no other number in the entire universe does. Mm. It exists between the number 27 and 25. The first time I told people that, they was like, okay, Rashid, you, what did you say? <laughs> did you just say some deep stuff? And I said, yeah, I did, because 27 and 25 are square and cube numbers. Nowhere in no sequence of numbers does one number exist in the middle of a square number and a cube number. Hmm. This can be, so true numerology is just a Google away. Google some high-end mathematics if you want to know number function. So then we attribute deity through sound vibration and give each sound uh, denoted a number. So Aleph, Beth. Gimel, Dalit, mm -hmm. Heath, Bao, Zane, Kef, Tech. Yeah. We go all the way and it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But when we get to 10, we go 20. And then we go 30. And that's how L is 30. Then after L is 40, M is 40. After M is 50, Noon. So now, very interesting thing. Hold on, because can, of can the new break that down for me one more time. Let me go. Let me let 30. me exhaust this this thought so you can know that sounds. When you hear sounds inside of ancient language, they're speaking about number function. So a term like this, Anunnaki, people love that term. The New Age movement and a lack of knowledge and ignorance on people, period, attribute that to aliens, brother. And it has nothing to do with aliens. It is a, it is a astrological term that's associated to the god Marduk and the idea of the sky having 50 points of deline delineation. The number five and the number 50, if it's five, it's this close. If it's 50, it's spread out like that, right? So you, you have the, the 50 deaconates in the sky, the five deacons in the sky, people who are right, like my brother Raku. When I say certain stuff to him regarding Kabbalistic nuances, he totally understands because he has a whole uh, plethora of information regarding exact, nuance, very highly nuanced numeric factors as to how to delineate the sky. So I can hit him with a myth that includes this number in there and he totally understands it but now when you go back in ancient people and you go look at somebody like the egyptians they have a narrative story where they use numbers in their narrative they say that 
their deity, uh, Osar, loses his phallus as a result of having a fight with his brother, and his phallus is given a specific number. They call it the what? The 14th piece. That was what? Consumed, right? By a fish. What is the 14th letter in the Hebrew alphabet? A fish. What is it called? A noon. You heard? So these are nuanced symbols, right? Left behind, almost like if you're getting lost in the forest, you just leave little crumbs behind and you can follow your way back to where your point of origin was. Do you, is there a direct correlate to something that people can immediately understand and, and be like, this bull, that's not how this works. You heard? Like, you said your name 19 keys. In my mind, that sounds like you don't got one key to solve one problem. Sound like you got 19 of them. You heard? But what if you lose your keys and somebody pick them up? I don't know none of them doors, dude. You heard? And this is the thing with Kabbalistic parlance, Kabbalistic um, uh, 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 terminologies. So like the term for the, the very first word in the Bible is Bereshit. But when you remove the B. What does that mean? It means in beginning. Oh, we can have a whole dialogue on just that one word. Because it can mean, it, it really, I, I really mean, I know what it means. I say that it means it establishes for the reader what the book is about. The book is about Baratu. And Baratu is the name of the diviner who has all of these various skill sets. He can do astrology, he can interpret dreams, and he can also do ecstasy rites. So he is one of the Baratu, right? And the Barashit, in beginning, it says, in beginning, God created. If you really look at it from a metaphysical perspective and from a symbol uh, um, a, a, a degree of symbol literacy, right? You will find that it's about uh, it's saying a process that the Bara too created God. It created heaven and earth, meaning that these are two locations that the Bara too is um interested in participating in his endeavor. You heard. For, for people to create a cosmology in a book and say that God, like who is the person watching God do all of this? And then on the first day, God said, do this on the second day. God, who was the one page in that? Like, well, did he have a stenographer? You feel me? And what type of psychology requires, what kind of great God is this, dude? If we got to count days, dude, let's get right to it, my nigga. For real. But do those days mean, I don't, I don't know those days mean and I'm not a, a Bible scholar, so I, I barely I, speak on thing, biblical references. Don't, don't, but, don't, don't waste the time. Don't but, even get but, into it. No, just the <laughs> idea of days and time, right? Yeah. Like, because, you know, a 24-hour cycle, you know, because based on different societies, they have different ways of even counting time, right? Time exactly. changes based on that factor. But when we're talking about a day, that day can be a completely different representation versus it being a a cycle of it's time in that, a this context. How, and this is how they do people. This is how they do, do people. They've been doing that for years. A one day in the, in the, in the life of God is 10,000 days. To, right. to, in the life of man is 10,000 days. Because then the if you add an S to say, okay, on day one or on the first days, right, then it could mean in the many days of the beginning of it the cycle of that. as it flows. That's why I can't stand that, that whole thing with the re religious thing. It's all, it's all, brother, the, the, um, without, it's in my books. I wrote three of them shits on that, on the subject. Mm -hmm. And I still, I'm, I'm going to, um, compile my three and create a fourth and release it with everything in it. Where... But they still powerful though. That's the one thing about the books. The books are a, it's a compilation of thoughts and patterns and codes and 
doorways and keys. And the way you know they powerful is because of the effect that it has, right? The interesting thing about, because you said you wrote books, which I believe is a, a, a responsible testament to a person saying when they don't like something, then they create something as well to be in place of that thing. I didn't like that. We cursed in every book. Every book said that we cursed because of our color. Mm. Our color is a result of a curse. What's the original meaning of curse? What was that word that said that we were curse? Well, it would take an examination of the location of the two locations where the curses occur. There's two locations in that the number of the entire verse for when they cursed us for our skin because we saw the nakedness of our father is the same numeric equivalent of the verse for when women defied man in the garden and we were cursed subsequently. So whoever was the translator had an issue with black people and women. So who is the author of the translation? Is it us? Absolutely not. So who does that benefit? If the people of color are cursed and women in general are cursed and humanity is cursed because of a woman's disobedience, who's the mistranslator? You see? And then you look in ancient text. And when I say ancient, I hate saying the word ancient because the further you go, the less books you find. Mm. Books is a new thing, kind of, bro. You heard? Um, whenever somebody say that the oldest this, the oldest book, the oldest book, I'm like, man, y'all tripping. Y'all just use, y'all love that pilgrim. Y'all love him to tell you his meaning of things, but have yet to question the fact that he says that you're cursed in the book. Well, like I said, I can't speak on the biblicals and I'm sure all the, 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 the biblical scholars and decoders in the world have their take on it. I'm a, I'm a logical mathematician in my mind. You know what I'm saying? The type of God that I want to be or I am on this planet earth, you know, requires me to see things as they are and to add my observation of interpretation based on but I believe the value of that meaning could be, right, in a formula that I can use. And if it doesn't have practical value. But I also, I also understand the value of things that I don't know, right? That I could open up a Bible and I'm going to see it completely different than the average person because I'm going to look for the value and the meaning that can be applied to my life in some sort of way that adds, right, optimization. That's why I like Jewish mysticism. That gives you the plasticity of mind to allow you in a healthy way individually to process parts that may um, defy reasoning. You know? But everybody is stuck to their own level of consciousness. No matter what you tell a person, they can only um, apply meaning based on their level of understanding. Right. Right. You can tell them all day long. A thousand people can sit in the church and get completely different messages, especially depending on where they are in that life and what that message means to them. Right. Because you're pulling on different emotional and spiritual cords and different psychological profiles and, and breakdowns. So you can tell everybody the same word and they're going to be like, oh, this means this because I just went through this. Another person said this means this. I correlated to this. So people are always coming up with their own meaning and assigning their meaning when they go home. No matter if we're using the same word or not, because emotion is a form of a filter that we interpret things to through. Yeah. Right. And we are not a people that exist, especially non-emotional. We are always in the wavelengths of those emotions, especially going through trauma. Right. Right. So in, in this reality, getting a people first to get to the point of seeing things numerical. Right. I forgot what episode I was on. I was talking about how, you know, how the, the value of numbers, especially because when people talk verses, they're talking numbers, you know, verse 19.1 or 16.1. We're always going to these number systems, which is like going to star systems, speaking on correlations, coordinates, right? Where, you know, something exists and this is where we can observe this existence, right? This idea. And, you know, if as we want to get back into master mode, we have to get into the mind of that which can create the things, right, that we worship. Right. What's the mind of a people that can create their own books, 
right? Those are masters, right? Or do we just exist at this point where we're happy that there were architects of a world and we just take on the relics? But the value of it is the ability to create it, not just the creation itself. Mm -hmm. The ability to create it speaks to a separation between degrees of human beings and their ascension while they're living. When I was studying for my book to, to write it, I found out and I discovered that ancient people used to participate in this act. It's called pseudo epigraphia, where they would attribute books to that. They would write the book mm -hmm. and attribute the book to the author of someone from the ancient time. They do it for pecuniary reasons or to just to validate the notion that the book has true import. Right. Mm. And there are instances that a lot of scholars have found that people are saying the same lie 2,000 and 3,000 years apart. They are all claiming descendancy to this particular line or group of king, which was a thing that humans used to do prior to having books. If you encounter another human and you ask them, who are you and where are you from? The first thing the human does is start to attribute to themselves all of these um, fancy <laughs> uh, the descendants of yeah, King Yeah, I know. Everybody you know? is king. That is the most absurd thing that I've ever heard in my life, that there's people who said that they are true, that they are related to people inside the Bible. I feel like the, the your past ass is crazy. Only the present can be proof of your royalty, not the past. If you are not royal in your present, Right. Then you can't claim royalty in your past. Right. There's no royalty in a book that say we curse is my thing here. I would never want to be a part of under no. Well, I just I just mean just from ancestry, period. Just like how some people be like, yo, I was a king or I was this, that and the third. But it's like, yeah. are you of royalty today? Are you a king today? Right. Right. Then that's not who you are. Right. right? That may have been who your ancestor was. Or right. somebody had to work for them. You know what I'm saying? Somebody right. had to be the person that painted the pyramid or whatever the hell was going on. Right. Everybody wasn't goddamn architect. We know who that was. Right. So the 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 fact that we need human beings got so insecure that we need to be royal in the past to yeah. make us feel like we somebody in the present versus being royal in the present, which don't matter what I was in the past. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't care if my ancestors were screw uh, shoe scrubbers. That's not who I am today. You know what I'm saying? They would have to then look forward and be like, yo, in the future, we royal. You know what I'm saying? Or a person that doesn't have royalty in the, in the present would have to say, well, in the past, I was royal. Yeah. No, I would rather my ancestors have a vision for their future descendant in saying that I am going to descend into royalty. Right. Right? Versus now we talking about we came from royalty, but we're no longer there. Right. So you're speaking on past nobility instead of, you know, future wealth. Right. So that's why I'm more forward thinking. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't care what they were in the past. Yeah. That tells me information of maybe what I need to overcome. What's a platform that I can utilize based on what's in me and what I can add to it to optimize self. Yeah. But it don't tell me who I am. Who I am is who I am. Yeah. And that is deterministic about the way I think, the way I express myself, and the way I go about moving right. from day one to day zero, right? So in life, everybody gets to decide their coordinate, right? And create a verse on where you want that coordinates to be, right? Right. I've created that verse, 19 keys. That's right. the coordinates. The person goes up and they look up 19 keys, they start to see the observation of my star system, yeah. the energy that I leave behind, the burst of energy that I add to the world. Boom. Yeah. Recognize my star system. I'm not saying go back to Queen Sheba and Tutai comment. I'm not telling you to go that far back. I'm telling you to look at me now. Then I'm telling you that See, I'm telling my ascendant's going to be I'm even better than me. I feel you. I love what you just said. My sh I'm going to, an, I'm, I'm going to take it this step. Not, not call it a step further. I'm going to take another step. Ain't no such thing as Queen Sheba. Mm. Queen Sheba is the sun star Sirius. Mm. It's Shabda. And when you find females inside text, they call them daughters. When it's groups of stars or it's one particular star, they call her a queen. Mm. And they say King Solomon received six 
866 talents of gold from her annually. So why is 666 not negative with connotes when we get there? But when we get to the New Testament in the book of Revelations, this number scares people. It's the sign of the beast in a sense. You see? So it's, well, it's the same. Well, I mean, that goes to, you know, when we talk about symbols, why the swastika no longer means good luck. People don't think about definitions or roots. We yeah. look at the branches and the last branch and the last fruit that came from it yeah. is what we attribute to what that thing is. Right. But that's not its root. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you can color an apple green, but yeah. that doesn't make it green. Right. You know what I mean? It's actually a red species, right? right. You can, in a, you know, uh, uh, poison that apple, but apples are not poisonous. The, the fruit of the forbidden tree in which you bit off of that apple that you took from it. But the root, the seed, right. oh, that seed was valuable. They just poisoned the apple, yeah. right? So we don't go back to root meanings. We stuck in fruits and branches of things, yeah. right? And the masters, every time you meet a master of somebody on their path, they always teaching you about the root of things. Right, because they know that's where the source of power, that's where the most dense nutrient is to where they can gather the most from. And you can give a man an apple, but if you give him seeds, he can feed his whole village. Right. So we go around giving each other fruit. You know what I'm saying? We don't give each other seeds. If I give you seeds, you no longer need me. I don't, I'm not even special to you anymore. If I give you fruit, you have to wait till I arrive again. Right, because the value of my presence is what I carry along with it versus decreasing the necessity for my presence by giving you the seed and increasing the value of your presence, right? By allowing you to create the thing that gives me value. So as we create a system where we have collective contribution to each other, it's giving each other seeds. Hey, these are seeds that I have. You know why I'm a rich man? Here's my seeds. Here, here are this. This is how you take care of them, right? Now, maybe you can, you can pay me for those seeds. You can pay me for the knowledge of how I use those seeds, right? You can pay me for what I build around them. There's so many values that you can create around it, but we get stuck on what's the value of this fruit, right? And if I can't sell this fruit, right, then it, you know, I'm not rocking with you. No, we have to go around figuring out how many farmers can we create? You know what I'm saying? Because that farmer can then go feed a town. That farmer can then go feed a city, right? But we're not doing that. We just want to be fruit salesmen right. all day long. So that's why I like to have these conversations that go into the root of things that speak on a high level, because it's not so much of what my interpretation is or what yours is. I'm giving you the seed. The seed and way it culminates within you and the way it culminates within me has to be different because I have a different frequency in which I'm going to grow that seed on and a completely different usage of it. You know what I'm saying? So this is the power dynamic of today is that once we become collaborative and we have this sense of, yo, because we don't have that many farmers. I'm watching this show called Yellowstone. Well, that show good as hell. It's about this fight for, you know, them to keep the Yellowstone and these white folks own it now, but the Native Americans owned it at first. And they, they showed them go through the wars, right, of maintaining this land, right, and the daily nuance, and they got to go through hella stuff in order to do it. But it's like, damn, it's, unrelatable in present time because I've never seen a melanated man who looks like me fight over land that he owns and he wants to control and preserve a culture on that land, hmm. right? We haven't seen that. We've seen people fight over the products that come from that land hmm. that someone else owned. So we never actually get to the root of a thing that's even worth fighting for, hmm. right? So what's worth fighting for today we have the ability to create media, right? If we was to seed into each other to evolve these things, then we can create more farms to where, whether it's media farms, whether it's education farms, whether it's school of mysticism farms, I want our people walking around knowing the arts, Kabbalah, uh, 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 esoteric teachings, occultism, and all these different knowledges and sciences around the planet Earth. So for me to gatekeep anything would not be useful to me because I can't seed and farm the whole planet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, I got to unionize this thing. You get the attention to when people grab and hear this information and be like, the way A.A. A. Rashid spoke, oh, man, I got to tap in with him. I need, the, I need his books. I need the sources of information. I need to hire him for design and collaboration. 
Now you have to go see the whole nother part of the planet that I don't touch or tap in. And that goes to the root of thinking. And I got this from Minister Farrakhan. He always talks about how, you know, the sun, right, shines where the sun can reach. And outside the reach of that sun is what the rest of the stars value is. Because there will always be areas of darkness, right? But if you can be a carrier of light into your zone, if you carry that word, that verse, that text, right? that book or that movie you make or that song you make, right? Or that product you make, all of those things are carriers of light, but we create darkness and then we spread darkness around each other, right? And so everything that we consume for each other starts to consume us. It's not good. And mostly because we're not even the root producers of that consumption. We're managers of it. So when, as we become better stewards, managers, uh, farmers, right? Mathematicians, the math is teaching us how to create the word because the word is creating on the numbers. So we know how to apply the meaning in the science versus just how to use what's created. Then we become the farmers. Like, you know, Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, I started off as a farmer who knew I would be a world-class scientist. But the science of the farming, right, teaches you how to do everything else. How do we go about rights of passage for these young men? When a person comes to you with a problem, What's the system of how to deal with them? Not, oh, I got an idea. What's the system, which is the culture? What we fight against the most, the system. We always complain about the system, right? So now the system is, hey, you know, master teachers, thinkers, philosophers, psychologists, and not even just of melanated origins, because we learn from different spectrums. Only black people are beholden to the scarcity mindset. When we see a white man interview a black man, we happy that he giving them that platform. We think nothing of in the way that he uses it, but we become slave masters to each other. Oh, you can't use it like that. You can't do that. You can't do this. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You giving me rules that you don't even follow, right? You creating codes of enforcement and can't even tell me what the value of it is in the trickle effect of me being empowered to help the collective. So going back to the root of everything that we do, we have to do it with consequence and we have to do it with meaning. And we have to prompt ourselves into a better existence. Peace, family. If you want to see us at the highest level, if you want to see us at the top of the podcast charts, <laughs> this is the way you can help, not just with your views and your attention. First of all, I want to thank you for being here, listening, watching, sharing. But we also need you to comment. This is how support looks like. I need you to comment the best thing you liked about the episode or the worst thing. It's up to you. Whatever you would like to share. Then I need you to go and put in the five stars. Go to Apple's. Go to Spotify's. Go everywhere. And I need to see them testimonials. And I need you to go on Apple and Spotify and download and subscribe. The more downloads we get, the better we get able to do a business. And the more we can grow this high level media. Again, I want to thank you all for supporting. Thank you all for tapping in. If you want to book, the booking email is 19keys at 19keys.com. Tap in. Now, I got a last question for you. Talking with my brother, uh, Wall Street Trapper, and he had just left this seminar, and he was telling me about, you know, the arrangement of these five values and what they mean to you, you know, specifically have... Um, it can correlate to how you optimize yourself and become successful. So, and you tell me in what order these have meaning to you. Expansion, adoration, contribution, importance, assurance. Adoration, mm. assurance, first two. And I say, I say so, I say so because, um, uh, Adoration is so very rare, and um, our, as my brother Oba always speak about, our true religions is based off of reciprocity models and comprehending the um, the honor system. You know what I'm saying? And if I can't honor you, I'll be damned if I'd be able to honor myself. Mm. You know. It's, 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 it's no way that I can honor myself and you not be honored. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and it shows a sign of um, emotional maturity when you can love your people everywhere you find them. 
despite what they're, whatever they're going through, I still have uh, an ability to, to love them. So I will put adoration mm -hmm. first. And then the second one is, uh, what again, King? Uh, um, we have expansion, contribution, and importance. The, what's the one that I put it? Oh, assurance. Uh, and assurance is very important because we were all children. And we were all children and we were all born uh, in a universe, a compact, like, miniature universe of, of uh, the unknown. And the very first thing that, that we acquired to soothe us of the pain of the unknown was the assurance of our mothers, mm. you know? And that's something that lasts for the remainder of a human's life is you will be revisited by childhood experiences for the remainder of your life. Um, so assurance is very important. And especially if you develop in relationships with people, humans, um, thrive off of assurances. You know what I'm saying? And in the presence of a lack of ass assurance, they, um, there's a behavior that's reminiscent of that as well. And you don't want what wishy-washy people because they're not sure of you. They're not sure of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. For real. I like that because adoration is love. And, you know, to that point, like, these are like things we don't think about a lot, right? What is the most important to you drives you and it controls the commitment of your actions daily. You know what I'm saying? Like going for like love is the most important thing. That's family. That's relationships. That's, you know, something that is of high importance. And a lot of people don't always say love. It could be on the third. It can be on the fourth. It could be on the fifth. Right. But love and second one was assurance, which would be certainty. You know what I'm saying? For me, when you have love in your life, right. What were the other three? It's What's contribution, the... importance, and expansion. I think, I think, uh, contrib I think contribution should go third. Important should actually be last. Mm. Important should be last. And, and my person, my personality, because right, right. it's kind of a nebulous term. I don't know what is important. Am I important or am I valuation of important things or acknowledging important things? Well, important. significance. Okay, okay. You know what I'm saying? Your significance in the world. Okay, okay. You feel me? Yeah. Which is really, you know what I mean? It could go last. It goes to intent. You feel me? Like, if, if at your, your growth, it's going to be with expansion, development, progress, maturation, your advancement in life, right? Yeah. Some people, for me, I do have growth as a high one just because I like to always grow. It's a measurement and a testament towards the things that I do adding up, right? And that's right. based on my logic system, right? They have to be adding up to something. If you see me, right. you like, kids, what you got going on? I got some growth going on. It's always something. It's yeah. some expansion. Right? Love, you know what I'm saying? Affection, adoration, devotion, fondness, passion. Right. All of those things are your battery pack in life. You ain't got no love in your life. What the hell are you doing? You yeah. feel me? The people, if you don't have love for others, you don't create love, that love is a battery pack that's going to keep things going forever. Yeah. As long as there's love there, you solid. And if love is at a high level of importance of growing love in your life, then that love that you have for things grows everything else yes. as well. Yes, sir. Significance, or let's go to contribution, is participation, involvement, um, philanthropy, you know, input, offering, right? Like, what is that thing that you offer to the world? You know what I'm saying? What do you add and contribute which can go to collectiveness, right? What is the significance of my skill sets that matters to everybody else, being a servant, if you will? Significance goes to importance, meaningfulness, relevance, consequence, or weight, right? Um, me, I don't always think about significance, though it's there. Significance in the sense of, like, what is the value of something? If it's not valuable, then I find it pointless, right? So I'm not always thinking about what is the factor of my significance, because I think regardless if I follow those other things, it will create significant impact anyway. 
but I actually do want to create moments of significance and reality. Because if it's right. not significant, then there's nothing to weigh on it. And then the last one is certainty, you know, uh, assurance, confidence, conviction, definiteness, sureness. Me, I'm a very certain individual and that matters. And the people around me have to be confident, right? And it also, I think uh, the necessity for over-certainty, though, can create insecurity when you don't have it, right? So for me, it just has to be into the flow of things. And my certainty goes into as long as things are flowing and I'm working, right, then that's how I know that this proof of everything will be solid. Yeah. And everybody gets to arrange what's their value system, yeah. right? But that value system will directly be proportionate to your success in life. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you want to optimize on the most. That's right. So love and growth, you know what I mean? Or love, I think, should always be number one. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now, as a good person, yeah. you feel me? Everybody don't care about love. Right. You feel me? Some people just want the money. I think the best, uh, the best work I ever do always comes out of my, a love to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I do anything ostentatiously or if I do things to be seen, doesn't oftentimes come out the way that I want mm -hmm. to. I think the universe operates in that way too. It does you like this. If you do real good work without wanting to be seen, then it'll pick the opportune time to celebrate you publicly. Mm. But if you always want to get celebrated publicly, mm -hmm. you really need the help when nobody's looking, the universe is not going to be there for you. Mm. you know? Do you feel within your life, and it's just a personal question to you, that reciprocation has always been granted because you are a person that has given a lot. And do you feel that reciprocation has been granted in your life consistently? I, very good question, brother. That that's a question, people don't ask people questions like that. And that is a very personal question. And I'll answer it to say that I'm under the impression that what I have to give comes from a thing that I've been bequeathed, mm. right? And, um, and do I feel like I've been, sometimes the reciprocal models, sometimes if I'm dealing with a mindset that does not benefit me sometimes, not an external mindset, a mindset of my own, I won't see the reciprocal model. I'll, I'll feel like, I'll feel like I'm alone, mm. but then here it is. This is when the universe starts reminding me, it'll send me uh, someone who needs a good word. Mm. And then the first thing they'll say is, man, I feel alone. And I'll go, you're not alone. You're in a community of trees, plant, books all type of things, the community of the stars. And then that's where my reciprocal model comes in, that I needed a reminder to remind myself. So as they say, when I speak to you, I speak to myself mm -hmm. kind of thing. You know what I mean? But um, it takes people a minute. You could, I think the African-American male suffers the most, not from anything else, but from a lack of appreciation. Mm. That is our biggest killer, brother. And it seemed like the whole planet is in on it and don't even know it, that they really fucking around. They playing with, they, 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 get, they get the jollies off of our discomfort, mm. you yeah? And then they, and then if you, if, if you make us uncomfortable, you can get a check, man, with mm. this world, man. Mm. Don't make no easy way for us and you good. Mm. That's like a, that's like a sign on bonus to anybody that's not an African-American man, mm. for real. This make our life difficult, you know, and we'll give you a reward, you know, and you see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. And then it, it would, it would, it would, it would, it can create some uh, debilitating mental issues mm -hmm. if you don't have a certain type of fortitude to understand, again, everything ain't for everybody. Mm -hmm. my, 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 what I have to offer may not very well be a universal thing for everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that hits home. You know what I mean? I think the lack of appreciation is a epidemic. Yeah. You feel me? Like, 
And here's the thing. The voices of black men are often ignored for yeah. the assumptions of what the world wants to project on us. Yeah. So we say one thing and they say, no, this, no. And so the more that happens, which has been happening your whole life from a boy into a man. Yeah. So you learn coping mechanisms to deal with the world that doesn't really care. Right. Never truly want to hear your true voice. Right. Right. You're told whether you're told it or whether people react a certain way, whether they say they want to hear it or not, yeah. they'll use it against you. Yeah. Right. They it doesn't create any value. You don't feel like you can talk to anyone. So what that does is, you know, it puts you into the darkness. Yeah. And in that darkness, you're supposed to go through darkness for a point of growth. Yeah. But when a person's just like, damn, I'm in a darkness, but I don't see no outlet for it. So now you get used to being in the darkness because this is the only place of shelter for you and your feelings and your emotions. And you just got to leave them there. Because right. when a black man expresses himself, now he's crazy. Now he's going on a rampage. Now he's angry. He's violent. Yeah. He has issues. He's toxic. There is no transparency. There's no safe place in reality right. right for a black man besides his own mind right right and his mind sometimes is not even a safe place because of the way he judges himself right so there is all of these nuances and the complexities of who we are is dealing with our own royalness right but having to be you know uh peasants in a world that don't recognize our nobility right it's like you walking around and be like wait a minute yo i'm i'm a king like look look what i am and you're like Bro, we don't honor that here, brother. Right. You know what I'm saying? And not even in your own home, not in your place, nowhere. It's not honored nowhere. Right. It's like, go take that somewhere no, where it matters. They, and, they, and the attitude is that you're supposed to just accept that and just be strong. That's be what strong really makes men crazy, especially the warrior class. And then you look at the statistics and you see how many pe people are in prison that, um, that are of African-American um, descent. Like it used to be, all pilgrims used to be in jail. Mm -hmm. Now they 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 they've taken on a new stride. They like this now. Nah, we good. Mm -hmm. Let y'all do that. Right. And now we've never left. Every culture has came to the penitentiary and left. Mm -hmm. The Irish used to be the ones mm -hmm. all in the joint. The Italians used to want to be all the one in the joint. Then they started saying, you know what? We finna be the police. We good on this. Yeah. Because there's no cultural acceptance. If if a Native American steps outside in their tradition of where they're going to be looked at, mocked. You know what I mean? If they walk outside practicing their practices, you know what I mean? They're going to be talked about because they're not assimilated into society. So there's nowhere to express their spirit. Right. That creates an automatic depression. There's nowhere for the energy to flow or go. Right. right? There's nowhere for us to gather and be ourselves. So that's the whole thing where if you look at Native Americans, they have a high rate of depression, a high rate of suicide, kidnapping, disease, murder, alcoholism. Similar to how the black man is in America. He's in and a place our, that he calls home, is, but he's not accepted. And our other thing is we don't we haven't adequately developed a uh, cultural practice to honor death and to grieve appropriately. Mm. So death has become a demeaning thing. Now it's so demeaning that I'm like, yo, as a teacher, as someone who people put, I told you somebody hit me on the DM. And the nigga just asked me, just said, send me your number. Yeah, I get that crazy. I'm stuff. like, nigga, I don't know you like that. I don't care who you think you know and all these pictures that you think you know somebody. Yeah. Don't ask me for my phone number like that. Yeah. You need to honor me yeah. as a person. So I'm like, Ooh. they don't they don't honor you as honor a person. Honor itself is a strong word because we don't it use is. it. I, I, if you don't honor yourself, then you can't honor nobody. Mm. So I'm like this. How about when you die? I'm like, oh, I'm like. I'd rather, sometimes I'm thinking like, I'd rather die of nobody than to die with these niggas playing with me on the internet. Mm. Acting like we was mad cool. Yeah. Like, I'd be seeing that, oh, Lord, don't die as no conscious person. Oh, man, nah. Nigga, this they is why... like this. <laughs> Yo, they gonna play with you. Yeah. You feel me? You gotta Attributing ex shit to you that you didn't even know. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's why you, you, you have to expand beyond the image that people want to box you in. Because right. it's literally like taking your spirit and putting it in a small box. But while you're living, you say, I'm living enormous. I'm supposed to die enormous. But they like, nope. Here, this is who you are. You know what right. I mean? Stop saying you all of this and you all of that. This is who you are. And then you live off a system that can't even measure your true value. Right. Because this system, if you don't have the money, 
then you don't have the value. If you don't have these things, and you may not even want those things, right? right? So it's like, I don't even want those things. And unless I get the things that society says are the measure of why people should treat me with honor, then I'm not treated that way. But if I get those things, I'll go against myself and therefore I'm depressed. Therefore, I'm doing things that I don't want to do. And then you're not going to be honored to yourself. So it's a lose-lose system. So you have to create your own world. And in that world, you have to be honored by and teach people how to honor you or do not accept them within that world. Teach. And, and what I've been, because I, I, it got to a point where. Which is usually a man's home. Right. And it got to a point where I was like, let me, st- I don't even want to talk like this about this because the shit, it sounds like I'm complaining. Right. So I said, what do you do in this instance if you don't feel honored, right? You don't feel honored, you don't feel respected, the, the recipro- reciprocity models is not there. Then you know what you got to do? You got to honor yourself higher than you ever did before, mm-hmm. beyond, the, in, beyond any, and then you can en- enamor yourself with the feeling of, I have this total presence now that I don't need you to honor me. My presence, I'm so present. No, I'm talking about on this level where I'm so yeah. present now, right? That I'm back to my to my what I'm here for and why mm-hmm. you even know me. Got Bill Jones statues. Yeah. I'm here for, I'm here now to facil- help facilitate you. Being that you don't know how to mm-hmm. do it for me, let me just do it for myself. Mm-hmm. And then enamor you with the ability to perhaps do it for yourself and maybe do it for others if you're um called upon it. Maybe it wasn't my turn for you to honor. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then when when you built that thing up, like when you build your own statues to honor thyself, right? People later on will honor you. Yeah. Right? They don't know how people of time felt. They could have thought you was egotistical and, and tyrannical. Right. But when we look at and we see statues of men that are remembered for things that they built, we honor them. We study that. We give, you know, reverence to it. It's appreciate. Oh, you must have been important. You must have been this person. Some people are smart enough to know that, you know, honor doesn't always have to happen just in your lifetime. It can happen 20 generations later when they find out who you are because you was the only one that survived throughout time to be honored of your people. Hmm. So it's like you have to build your own statues and that can go into whatever you leave, Hmm. right? But if you wait for the world to honor you, you may never get that honor. You know what I'm saying? You may never be remembered. So you have to create your own systems and you have to create a strategy in the world that is not yours yet, right? In a time where the world is yours, they may dig up the memories of an A.A. Rashid or a 19 Keys and be like, whoa, these must have been the giants of that time, right? But in your time, you may be in the midst of, you know, the internet and the noise throughout the world, and they may be comparing you to somebody who's not even honorable. They may be comparing you to somebody who, when the A.I. starts to be like, bro, Y'all so messed up. Y'all don't even know how to honor the most intelligent or the wise ones in y'all society. What y'all honor is the most popular ones. You So you honor people just because they honor, not because they're honorable. You know what the AI models are doing now is they are feeding the human whatever. It starts picking up your nuances for, and you know how they say, oh, would you like to share your activity across other boards and other, what you call it? And other apps, mm-hmm. right? The model starts picking up not only the fact that you're bugging, but your friends are bugging. Mm-hmm. And that it starts intimating, like understanding in the way that, oh, this is the time period where y'all start arguing. You heard? We approaching the holiday season. Y'all, y'all don't, y'all ain't farmers. Y'all ain't got no food. You heard? Mm-hmm. Y'all forgot all of that shit y'all was doing in the summer. You finna get sick. Mm-hmm. So let me start inundating you with that stuff that keeps you focused. So then you could be in a social interaction relationship with somebody and they'll send you a link to something that has nothing to do with you and them. And it is the most disrespectful and passive aggressive thing ever. And I used to always be like this, stupid. What do this have to do with us? Well, why are you sending me this? Why does somebody else suffering mm. have an, uh, why are you attributing that to our interaction? And I know why. It's because you don't have the brain for the internet and you shouldn't be on it. You know what I say? 
50% of marriages work out. I'm going to say this, probably get this in every episode. And the, the phrase is a symbol for the way we look at things. Because normally we hear 50% of marriages end in divorce. So a person is not going to usually send you a couple whose relationship is just thriving and working out. And they say, hey, look, babe, let's optimize and add more of this. Let me show you more of thriving and working out. No, they're going to say, hey, this is why this couple failed. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. Because we don't look at the success, the cures. We don't look at the thing that can improve. We look at the things that's not working. So we're more scholarly on what doesn't work than what does. We know the problem better than the solution. So my whole thing for that is anytime you get that, remember, 50% of marriages work out. It's always the way you look at things. So don't bring things to my perspective if that's not the way you want things to work out. Right, right, right. Very good at it. analogy. <laughs> First of all, my brother, I want to thank you because, um, you know, you can go into many different, you know, texts, ideas, thoughts, ponderances, reflections, philosophies. You know, you can go into many different things and the average person it's not always ready. Well, 90% of the world ain't ready, right? We know that. But for those people that want to tap into different pockets of dimensions of thought to observe the world like the masters of this world, they can tap in with you, right? Truth is almost illegal today yeah. and offensive, yeah. especially to a slave. A right. slave has conditions and rules they must follow. Right. So the moment you tell them to do something against those rules, they feel fearful for their life, right? Right. And that fear, as we stated earlier, man, it burns calories, yeah, right? You, your adrenaline start pushing. So by the time they're done dealing with you, they're deprived of energy to do anything about the thing that they fear. Yeah. So this is why it's presenting to us the problem too much is like a horror film, right? You, 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 you're killing the spirit. So when we're talking about those things, and if you sit here and you watch a high level conversations, you've been empowered, right? Black men will have their day. Our people will have their day. Melanated people will have their day. We got it. Yeah. And our future begins when a really big shift takes place, whether it's already happened or whether it will happen, that we recognize as, as you talked about, the song that the slaves sing to let the one know it's time to go in the house and get the extra for us. Right? But if we don't know to recognize that or the collective doesn't know how to sing that song or to make that movie or to make that product or that moment to speak that truth. We don't know how to give each other signals to let us know, like, this is how we improve our condition. This is how we optimize. This is how we get to freedom. This is how we get to power. Today, it's about creating the systems and the routes to power. That's right. A generation will be a very systematic generation, yeah. a generation that creates all of the systems for us. And the takeover is happening throughout time because there's a dilution from you know, the, the evil, there's a dilution from the evils of the world to us actually getting to a good place, meaning that we're going to dominate this planet regardless. Time is going to give us that gift. But once what we do up until that point where we in a dominant is what matters, because we have a recessive mindset, then we can't dominate. Right. So people talk about population size. Do you want a population of a bunch of weak men and women, ignorant, dumb, sterile, can't do anything? or I would rather a smaller population of great ones, right? That's a much larger size. So this is the time period where we're getting ready to be a dominant, but then when you're dominant, you better have some plans for the affairs of your people and your planet. Otherwise, you're still gonna be left up to the minority to let you know what to do because they have the authority, because they have the audacity to actually put in the work to know how to deal with the affair. I can give you all the land in the world what you'll do with it. Right. You can only do what you know. So you can go out there and starve and die because you didn't know how to till the land, right. right? You didn't know about the different seasons change, how to prepare for winter, what to do to prepare for summer, how to rile the people up, how to create these systems, towns, cities, states, right? Countries, right? You may not know those things. So do you want it before you're ready? Or do you want to take this time now while you got your head down, right? You really could have your head in a book. You really could be learning and training to for that time where you are the heir to the planet. Yeah. So this has been another high level conversation. 
with the good brother A.A. Rashid. Make sure y'all tap into the next one. My right. brother. Peace and love. Peace to the God. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm 19 keys and this is high level conversation. Tap in with the God. This is uh, from your book. This book, um, Dog Star Hip Hop. And it's interesting because on this page, it has the words keys and it has 19 on both of them. One of them says... <laughs> Keys are required to secure a doorway or a gate through which one walk. I couldn't have believed the word key that we use to describe the utensil through which we open gates or doorways or other reality derives from the biblical Hebrew Ki Kai. While the English translation of the commission word Kai when used before nouns as other or another are used to bridge the gap of space in the mind of those examining the narrative. Um, it says the need to express the perspective between self and spaces around you are crucial in linguistics. Kai offers the mind the ability to describe the other thing. As the word bu, it appears in both the Dogon and Kamishan languages to describe the concept of the timeliness. Now, to kind of fast forward, it kind of goes into the letter sound B was present at the time of creation, which you talked about, you know what I mean, within this. But then it goes into talking about the numerical value of what well, it says, the time of creation epic in the form of the word bohu, meaning the void from. Then it says the numerical equivalent of bohu is 19, huh. and it is a prime number being only divisible by his own self or the I'm number one. The symbolic void <laughs> <laughs> being within the context of nine digits as one through nine. So, of course, this is definitely in alignment with the way I observe and see 19 keys your last line is say you can observe the infinite by observing the finite yeah right so in your observation what does 19 keys mean 19 keys I already told you the bohu key 19 keys is 19 doors 19 keys is 19 doors mm. A key is nothing without a door. Mm. The next play is the doors. Easy. Mm. 19 doors is 19 books, brother. Mm. It's 19 new books. Yeah? I didn't get you all the keys. I seen you. I seen you. What they say? The glow up. I met you when crypto first came out. Yeah. You the first person I ever heard say something about it. That looked it like me, though. Yeah. You feel me? And then I was like, okay, I still didn't get it for a minute. Then I was like, NFTs, like shit, NFTs. Then I went to Art Basel. Yeah. Remember down there, that digital one. Yeah. Then came back and sold me some NFTs. <laughs> paid the rent. Yeah. Paid rents, right, with it. So I seen the evolution. So I see the go getter. I see the groundedness. You were uh, a Taurus, right? Yes, sir. So you what you call it? You very pragmatic. You know what I'm saying? So um, doors are part of homes. Yeah, I can see it. I can see that for real. But then I, it also harkens on this. That's a that's a very good name because I was born in a nation. That's one of my favorite parts of Muhammad speak. Yeah. When, when, um, yeah, Mother Tanella. Yeah, when, 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 um, uh, um, on the number 19, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a, it was a common thread in the narrative in the newspaper speaking about how that number threads itself through the Quran and everything. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, whenever our people use numbers inside of colloquial terms and in, 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 in encapsulated in colloquial vessels like a book it acts as an act of sorcery yeah so it empowers the book so mm. the book is now empowered with the number function mm. you know what i'm saying so the um ain't but it ain't nothing it ain't no other numbers but nine numbers and then it's a recapitulation of them consistently mm -hmm. so that's how i was like english is not one of them them like why would they make the word key out of the word 
the cognate for life. The keys are life, the key of life. We've, he we've heard that. Stevie Wonder made a record. Songs in the what? Key of life, right? So that's what I get. I mean, amongst other things, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And then there's a verbal language and then there's a visual language. You know what I'm saying? How would that look? You know what I'm saying? For real. All right, so the thing we do with the book is, you know, we just, we allow you to just open it up at a page. Yeah. Probably read the first verse or paragraph, and then we just explain what that means to each one of us. And Which one what? you want? Yeah, just open up one. Okay, so just anything randomly? Anything random. Okay. That's the exercise. Okay. <clears throat> Administrators and teachers were identified and the effects on students were assessed. The qualitative data of the observations and the interviews provided personalized, intimate understanding of the social phenomena, and the quantitative test added objective data. The results of each method, qualitative and quantitative, revealed that boys and girls belong to separate cultures. Mm. The qualitative data show clearly that it is to some degree the result of different expectations for girls and boys and different treatments of the sexes by teachers. The quantitative data showed significant differences existed only between attitudes of the male and female students regarding the role and status of women. No significant differences were found in public schools in the same neighborhood. What that what that mean to you? What did it bring up? Um you know what we're actually doing is a thing. You know, this is a, mm. a, this is a version of divination. Mm. People, I forgot the exact term of it, but people do this with um, book. They're looking for key phrases to identify with something mm -hmm. that's going on. You know, and what I um, what I got from that is um, it just reminded me of my studies of. Uh, of uh, childhood psychology and 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 like anthropology, there's an anthropology <clears throat> of human behavior that occurs on the playground. That you can uh, there's there's this there's this idea in humans' minds that children are the kindest and the nicest people in the world, and they've said that the most violent humans. And the most irrational humans are actually like young children. You heard? And you notice when you was a kid out in the playground that kids, they don't got no filter, bro. They'll go yeah. in. They don't care. They just talk crazy to you, talk about your mammy and everything, you know? And they, they put hands on you, hand feet, you know what I'm saying? They be bugging. Yeah. So, yeah. And then it establishes uh, hierarchical structures, you know what I'm saying? For real. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> because I mean, well, as a child, you don't have context to, to anything. So I guess that kind of goes into a child can be evil without context, right? Cause if you know, you have to know what the effect is. So if I punch you, I don't have real consequence of knowing what pain means to you yeah. or that I can black your eye. Or if I say something to you, right. I don't know the context that it can hurt your feelings or what feelings are or right. the or how that can go about affecting you for your days or what the rules are in society or what a rule is anyway. So right. a child is just being free. So in that, you know, a child is considered to be savage because a child has to be indoctrinated in order to be civil. Right. You know what I'm saying? But savage is more so just, you know, a man <laughs> or woman within their nature, not confined by rules of the civilization that they're in. Right. Because what's savage in a city is free in nature. Yeah. All right. So let me open up the power within us. Since God is invisible in all spirit, how is it possible for man to walk after him and to cleave to him? The answer is that man must emulate God's traits and thus walk after him and cleave unto him in spiritual ways. And God is merciful, the rabbi says. So you must be merciful. And God is kind, so you must be kind. And God is forgiving, so you must be forgiven. God attributes are outlined in the book of Exodus. He is merciful and gracious, 
patient and abundance and goodness and truth, forgiving and equity and transgression. Can we visualize a person who professes to be religious, disliking or hating anyone? Would it not be sheer hypocrisy to believe in the Lord on one hand and not practice goodness to one's neighbor on the other? Can a true religion justify proselytizing by force or any perversion of justice and equity? Can a religious person persecute another human being just because he has adopted a different mode of worship? Can he say, I shall confine religion to my synagogue or church and carry it into the marketplace? Can a truly religious person assert religion is one thing and business is another? And I ended right there. First of all, that's powerful right there. Oh, yeah. Powerful right there. Yeah. I think that encompasses a lot what we was talking about. Yeah. But for me, it first part of man walking in the traits of God, right? Many people are religious on this planet. They claim to follow Jesus. They claim to follow Yahweh. They claim to follow Buddha. But they don't claim to take on the traits of that which they follow. Mm. I'm a firm believer that in order to follow a teaching, you have to become it, right? You have mm. to become it. And then in order to be a really good follower, you have to take it further, yeah. right? Because you are allowing it to evolve and to live. What you do at 10 is not what you do at 20. What you do at 20 is not what you do at 30. Right. So for me, a text or a word or a knowledge has to mature right the longer it is here on this earth so that in the time that it is in it is appropriate so for me taking on god's traits i mean you know all religions have this common thread that people seem to ignore how can you be the person as you say that is religious to follow god's traits but do unjust thing and then how can you separate your religion from your business so how can we have a christianized society but also particularly our cruel capitalists ready to crush competition at any given notice for a dollar. How is that uh, one can bless a food that is not good for them, you know what I mean? And exist in a system to where we are okay with the world being the way that it is, lies being spread, but you're not following the traits that God will have, which is to create a just world. You know what I'm saying? So for me, walking in the mood or being a God is taking on the traits of God. And I say this a lot to be a God in the simple formula for me is to be able to utilize your mind, right? If I can take thoughts out of my mind, you can't tell me that's not an act of God. That is a God trait. That is creation. That is the making of something, right? That is production. That's godliness. So that to me is my greatest disapproval of anybody who wants to have an argument on whether I'm a God or not. You can't tell me I don't have God traits. And what you know of God is the traits that make him God. Yeah. Because if you describe something without the traits of God, then it's not God. So if you describe something with the traits of God, then therefore it must be his description. Right. That's niggas don't know what God is. Niggas, post-slave niggas, talking about somebody ain't a God or is a God is bugged out. You heard anybody trying to talk about that, for real. Especially when you're doing good work, Mm. that's deific you know what I'm saying as somebody trying to uh, say it's not yeah I feel like that's crazy that to me is them playing God because who would have the supreme power to say who is and who is not only God to me could even exist in that plane of authority you know what I'm saying God is everywhere God is in the if God is in the church God is in the whorehouse too Mm. so if God is infinite God is all over the place this is why I tell people, go back to African spirituality, because then you'll hear the stories. You'll hear how the most pristine and cleanest God, Obatala, sits in the bar and does not get drunk. He's just simply there to make sure everyone is equitable. Mm. In the illest bar, the ones with the most stickiest and the heaviest drinks, mm-hmm. and everything goes there. You heard? He's did not. He's sitting in the corner, clean as can be, just monitoring and making sure in the excess of all of that of um, evil, there's still equanimity in the in the room. Man, that's hella interesting. I just thought of like a a bouncer who is like religious that doesn't drink, but there to make sure that there's fairness that maintains in an environment. Like when you see the fruit at yeah. a at a rap concert. Yeah. 
you know you all right. Yeah. It's, they're going to be rowdy on the stage, but ain't nobody finna do nothing to this bow tie. Yeah. I promise you. Those, the angels in the room, the yeah. gods in the room. With the gators on. No, that's stomp your that's why out. gods make you feel so. so. You see the gods in the room, you feel safe. You feel good. Like, oh, man, the gods is here. All right, like, we good, John. Right. It's a good time. Right. You feel me? So it's that's interesting of who who wants to in, in, in anybody's life, they get to decide whether they want to be the God in the room. Yeah. Or the devil in the room. You want to stir it, yeah. right? Or you want to create order, be a symbol of order, bring symbols of order, bring something that creates that balance or creates that justice or that fairness right. or that, you know, equality in the room. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's up to you. Sometimes a person just be on demon devil time. But all I know is every time we in the room, the gods in the room. That's a fact. Really, um, I think this episode was powerful for people understanding, people taking a, a deeper dive into what's around them, just questioning things, right? So um, I'm gonna ask a question kind of a little bit from a selfish perspective. Something I always say is nothing is random, all right? Because I feel like there's a lot of synchronicities around us, the symbols and things we have to understand to get a deeper um, knowing of how to move throughout this world, right? So what I wanted to ask is, you know, what would you recommend somebody to do to get a deeper understanding of realizing the symbols around them? Obviously, you've done deep dives into research and you're well learned, you're well studied. So this is not just a path that somebody can pick up. They have to actually um, delve into knowledge that they really want to understand. But what can you say to just get people to think about their place in the world and understanding, um, you know, just the symbols of things, the the synchronicities of things. Uh, to exercise the mind in the realm of symbol literacy, one should endeavor to embrace the task of note taking and your notes should also have miniature images next to them. And you should start drawing your thoughts. And 25% of the brain functions off a of hand movement and things that you do with your hand. So you know this, if you work out, do anything, resistance training of any sort, it makes the muscle stronger. Same thing with the mind. You know what I'm saying? And same thing with the ability to comprehend high level symbols. You have to almost break the mind. You'd have to put... Um, the engine of a Ferrari inside of a Volkswagen, you hear, and not be afraid to hit the accelerator, knowing that it's going to break the infrastructure. You know what I'm saying? If you want to accelerate, you're going to have to, you're going to have to break the mold of the old way of thinking and adopt some 747 shit. You know what I'm saying? Like that. And it's also, language is very interesting what something means to me it means it very much so in four different ways and that exists for everyone whether or not they aware it, uh, of it or not you know your ability to process multiple meanings is a gift from the cosmos and the creator that you don't have to get locked in one method you don't have to check your subtraction in one way. There's multiple ways to check your math. You know what I'm saying? And not be afraid of it. And then, it, be honest with yourself. If you are a speaker of English, you should be reading, if you want to do some mind-bending tasks on your mind, you should read stuff that actually challenges your psychology. And if you read English, I'm like, you should read the, you should read the people who exhaust English and squeeze everything you can get out of English is the, the philosophers like Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, the, the translation that they enact on Nietzsche's work. You heard? Western philosophy has taken English to another level. We speak kind of a hybridized version of, it's like a, uh, a hood patois with our own nuances, but then we add, because we children of hip hop, so now we got a different kind of, um, we got a universal language almost where our hip hop, we can get on a plane and get off anywhere in the world and 
don't even have to speak. You heard our inflection. We will see other hip hoppers. They don't even have to speak English. So language is funny. It's based off of where you at and what you're doing with it. And if you see it as a, as, as a technological tool and a, as a source of utility. And the best way to um, access that, and then I don't mean to be mundane or like to make it real, like stop arguing with people, man. Stop having arguments with niggas. It fucks your mind up, bro. You heard? It destroys like any type of, any type of back and forth, you know, of anything. It, it removes, it's, it takes all the understanding out of the room. You heard? And then you're left there with this like nothing. You know what I mean? For real. I wanted to go back to the uh, conversation about the Bible specifically and religion uh, more broadly, because um, I think the core piece of what I took away from what you were saying, um, one of the things you were saying is that, you know, how could you look to a book for guidance that has you as an evil or has you as less than cursed, yeah, cursed, essentially. Yeah, right. All three of the major religions say people of color are cursed. And it's um, it can create mental health issues if you're not if you are a participant in those and you try to digress and you try to go this way that way. What kind of God is you dealing with, man? What kind of God is you dealing with? And look at the news right now. God's people are bugged out, bro. God's people be bugging. I don't want to deal with none of them. Fuck both of y'all. That's how I feel. You heard? I've been doing that shit for too long, like little fucking kids. Go sit your stupid ass down. You know what I mean? Like that. I, I don't give a fuck about who right or who wrong. Both of y'all wrong because your books say I'm cursed. With all due respect. Specifically, you know, you have mentioned, um, you know, I think it was in the in the really the beginning of the conversation. We were talking about magic and the breaking down that where you were talking about the the source of these African, you know, uh, spiritual practices and whatnot that people are really using as a principle. That's like, that's actually what the oppressors are using. They're still kind of maintaining these principles, but then not delving that information or kind of gatekeeping it from um, people as they're indoctrinated into like these main religions and things like that. So similar to my last question, what would you suggest or recommend for people to get, I guess, a pathway back to the original source? Like, what, what, how do you kind of put them in that, in that mind frame or where would you kind of suggest they go? Um, stop being afraid of yourself and, the, you know, what goes boogie, you know, boo in the night. You know, they got us spooked out thinking that we're the darkness, right? And... I'm of the mind that I am the darkness and I'm actually afraid of the light, bro. You heard? The light is the very thing that keeps blinding my folk. You feel me? So the darkness, if you look at what the word dark means in ancient languages, it's more than just one word for dark or black. It's multiple and they're all beautiful and they all have utility. We only have one word to describe a person and we call ourselves an, 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 an adjective. We're not even calling ourselves a person, a place, or a thing. We're calling ourselves an adjective. And that this is not. And then you're sitting up with the internet. This is the most interesting thing in the whole world is that there's more technology in this phone than it was to send a rocket to space, brother. The first time they sent the rocket to space, they had less technology. That's in this phone. So now we got the telephone and nobody ever heard of African spirituality. Nobody never heard of African um, um, divination systems. Nobody never heard of Lukumi. You never heard of Santeria. You never heard of Ifa. You know what I'm saying? Um, Yoruba, right? So I'm like, we don't have no excuse. We will Google everything else. We go get bots to go get a pair of sneakers as soon as it come out. But we won't go get a bot to go get a, what you call it, a reading, a dua, a odu. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Rashid, is a, is a, he's, a, um, he's an angel. 
And what I mean by that is he has his angle, right? He has the way that he perceives the world, sees the world, believes, right? And I believe that, you know, there are multiple tribes on this planet Earth. And when you listen to different speakers, people are going to subscribe to the person that speaks to their heart and to their mind and to their tribe. And we need that in the world because it's what allows people to have their thoughts to flow and to be like, I'm not alone in the world. There's somebody who thinks like me, who sees like me, who views the world the way that I do. And when we are not allowed the diverse ethnicity of our culture to be showcased right on larger platforms, we make people feel alone because we believe that no one thinks like us. No one knows my struggle. Right. He he speaks upon a lot of different things that I'm but a child in. Right. And the desk is for me to learn. You know what I'm saying? The desk is for me to be a student in the conversation. And so a lot of times when I have these conversations, I never think about, all right, you know, do we have to agree? No, that's the value of them. Right. By not agreeing, we're going to add different angles and different degrees and different perspectives. And the different perspectives and degrees is what allows it to be full circle. If we agree on things, then we can't get full circle. We can only add in the angle that both of us have. Right. So when somebody else say, no, I see it this way, but I see it this way. Another person see it this way. This now we got all angles covered. And so in a high level conversation, you know, we are in the conversation, but the observer is the other angle. The observer is the other perspective, always in the conversation, downloading. Oh, I wonder what Keys was thinking. I wonder what AA was thinking. I wonder how this was going to come about. Oh, I know Keys thinks like this. So why didn't he say this? It's all of that is to get you to think, you know, I, I, Compulsion, you know, I think comes from an insecurity that a person can arrive to the truth on their own when presented with the evidence, right? So for me, I know that human beings lack quality thinking. And so given enough time to think, they would derive to the ultimate truth, right? They will get those keys, those doors will open. And when they walk through that door, they're on the other side, going from this world to another, unlocking that zenith, that higher self, that peak self. So conversations like this, you know, I, I, I try to come in sometimes with ideas of where I want it to go, but I can't control the flow. Then I will press the conversation. I have to allow it to freely go where it goes because that's what a conversation is. We conversing, right? And, you know, whatever's made is made and you get to enjoy the dish and it becomes your food for thought, right? So I hope y'all liked up what we cooked today because that's what we had on the menu. And this is for the high level family, right? If you tuned in, you tapped in, it's change your life and you want to represent the symbols that represent that change, go step into the world so somebody else can see that symbol and ask like, what's a high level conversation? Then you can point them in a direction. That's what it's all about. You know the math, tap in. <laughs>